That's better. Thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, thanks for coming out this morning. Um, I think we've got a really exciting morning of discussion. Um, so first of all, brief introductions for myself. I am Witz Almaber. I'm the director of the Stevenson Ocean Security Project here at CSIS. Now, the Stevenson Ocean Security Project is a relatively new program we launched earlier this year. And we are a program that is explicitly focused on the intersection of marine sustainability challenges and national security issues. And from my point of view, there is no better representation of that nexus than the issue of climate change and how it's impacting our oceans and what that means for our broader world. Now, a few weeks ago, the IPCC released a third in a series of reports uh, about <clears throat> looking, taking a deeper dive in some of the impacts uh, that climate change is having on the world. First, as you may recall, earlier this year was focusing on what a 1.5 degree world looks like and what it would take to get there. The second focused in August, <clears throat> released in August, focused on the impact on lands. And then the one released uh, during Climate Week at the UN focused on the ocean and the cryosphere. Now, that report is fascinating. It is uh, the current state of the science about what we know, what we understand, um, the impacts of climate change are going to be on the ocean. And it posted a really, really stark view of the differences between taking strong, aggressive action and taking no action at all, continuing along the course that we are on. It talked about uh, a real divergence in paths with respect to um, change and needed adaptation based on what kinds of actions we take from a policy perspective. Now, there's been quite a bit of discussion, I think, over the past couple weeks about that report. We're going to talk a little bit about that report today and what's in it. But I want to take a special focus today on how the challenges and impacts that the report uh, describes translates into policy issues and, in particular, how those policy issues are reflected in the security space. Now, over the years, climate's been called a readiness challenge, a threat multiplier, a source of instability. Uh, it poses acute threats for today and strategic threats for tomorrow. But the ways in which the physical and ecological impacts translate to specific security issues can sometimes be a little vague. And unfortunately, as we know, bureaucracies don't do well with vague. So what I hope uh, today's conversation can do is move that dialogue forward and that we can think a little more deeply about the ways our natural, social, and security spheres are intertwined. As we do so, maybe we can move towards a more forthright and direct approach to coming up with solutions. As I've said before in this space, we need to manage the changing world of today for the changed world of tomorrow. So we're in luck. We have two excellent panels. Uh, the first, which I'm going to just hear uh, momentarily, uh, is going to talk about the science of the report and some of the findings and how those findings might affect specific policy issues. The second panel is going to talk about how those policy issues translate into security challenges. And then we're going to close up with a keynote uh, where I'll be joined by uh, the recently retired Admiral John Richardson, the 31st Chief of Naval Operations. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for coming today and introduce our first panel. Uh, I'll just briefly run through everybody here, and then I'll ask Co, our first uh, speaker, to, to come up and say a few words. So uh, we've got Co Barrett, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Science at NOAA. She's also the Vice Chair of the IPCC. We've got Bob Watson, who is the Chair of IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity. Uh, we have Paula Bontempi, the Deputy Director of NASA's, NASA's Earth Science Division. And we've got Kathy Mills, who is a research scientist at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and Pew Fellow. So thank you again for joining us. And Co, I'd like to welcome you on stage. Let's see if I can find you. OK. Thanks, Whit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my job this morning to just kind of kick off the conversation by providing uh, some of the most relevant findings from the report that we uh, put out just two weeks ago. And as a, as a kind of introduction to the report, uh, we're looking at the ocean and cryosphere, the frozen parts of the world, and their relationship to climate. And it's really the first time the IPCC has looked at the furthest reaches of the planet uh, to see what's happening uh, with regard to climate. So from the very tops of the highest mountains, the polar regions, to the deepest parts of the ocean. And what we find is that already there, and especially there, we're seeing um, evidence of human-caused climate change. Is someone going to advance these slides for me, or shall I magically do something? OK, great. Let's go to the next one, too. Uh, I'm not going to be able to talk about the high mountains and some of the, um, thanks, the um, coastal, yep. Um, 
you know, some of the coastal impacts uh, in my initial presentation, although happy to kind of dive into those with questions. Uh, but I kind of view the report Where do I point? <laughs> so I, I'll actually just kind of um, continue a little bit. We'll let the slides catch up to us. Um, so uh, kind of one of the main messages uh, emerging just from a macro level from the report is that for decades, the ocean and cryosphere have been taking the heat for climate change. Um, and we are seeing the manifestations of that across permafrost, glaciers, um, ice sheet melting, uh, changes in uh, ocean chemistry, and resulting changes in kind of biodiversity, um, the movement of fish. Etc. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, so the way I've structured this report is to just focus in on a couple of the changes that the report finds have already been observed, to briefly touch on what possible futures could look like, and then to talk about um, some of the implications for the uh, for marine um, policy. And, and for species migration, et cetera. So um, one of the main report findings uh, is not a new one in terms of Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets melting. However, the new finding here is that these are now the major drivers of accelerated sea level rise. And these areas are melting from below, which is a, um, causing it's now kind of surpassed ocean thermal expansion, expansion as a major driver for sea level rise. During the last century, we find that um, global mean sea level rise rose by about 15 centimeters. Right now, um, sea level is currently rising at more than twice that rate um, and continuing to accelerate. With uh, the highest uh, emissions pro uh, scenario projections, we could be over one meter of sea level rise by 2100. Also, over the uh, last 40 years, Arctic sea ice extent and thickness has very likely decreased for all months of the year. Uh, but sea ice changes in September, which is when we usually see the lowest sea ice extent, is likely unprecedented for the last 1,000 years. Next slide, please. Uh, the loss of summer sea ice and spring snow cover on land have contributed to amplified warming in the Arctic, where surface air temperature likely has increased by more than double the global average. Uh, the ocean has taken up more than 90 percent of the excess heat in the climate system and about a quarter of uh, human-caused CO2 emissions, making the ocean warmer, uh, more acidic, and uh, losing oxygen. Marine heat waves, which is a new topic, and Kathy may actually expand on this in her, her presentation, have doubled in frequency since the 1980s and have become longer lasting, more intense, and more extensive, especially um, harming warm water corals, kelp forests, uh, and the distribution of marine life. Next slide, please. I know you can't actually see the details on this slide, but I include it because this is this is kind of a graphic representation of what our choices on emissions reductions look like for some key areas. So on the top left is uh, the projections for marine heat waves moving into the future. The blue is, is kind of a projection for the lowest emission scenarios that we studied in our report. The red is a projection for the highest emission scenarios. And you can see quite clearly the difference if we choose a more intensive emissions reductions pathway. Um, below that frame is a graphic on Arctic sea ice extent, which isn't a good news story no matter what scenario you pick, quite frankly, uh, because even with a high emissions reduction scenario, we are still looking at something near 50% reduction. But with a, with a higher emissions, 
scenario, you see near um, near 100% um, reduction of sea ice extent in the Arctic in September. And the large graphic just shows the difference that would happen with uh, these two emission scenarios with regard to global mean sea level rise going out to 2300. So a uh, stark, stark difference depending on what um, action pathway we take. Next slide, please. So clearly there are implications for marine sustainability and security. Since about 1950, many marine species have undergone shifts in their geographic range and seasonal activity due to warming, sea ice change, biogeochemical changes um, to their habitats. In general, ecosystems are moving poleward. Uh, our recent ocean warming has contributed to an overall decrease in maximum cash poten potential, compounding impacts from overfishing for some fish stocks. In some areas, changing conditions have contributed to the expansion of suitable habitat, but it's not so easy. Uh, sometimes the governance uh, structures uh, regulating fishery don't make it possible to take advantage of the benefits that could be seen. Shifts in species distribution and abundance has challenged international and national ocean and fisheries governance, including in the Arctic. Um, and in terms of regulating fishing to secure ecosystem integrity. Next slide, please. Food and water security have been negatively impacted by changes in snow cover, lake and river ice, and permafrost in the Arctic. These changes have already disrupted access to and food availability within um, herding, hunting, subsistence um, uh, living areas, harming the livelihoods and cultural identity of the Arctic. I had the chance to uh, visit um, Alaska last month and saw firsthand how indigenous peoples are already having to change the way that they hunt, where they go to hunt, um, and it's, it's quite um, extreme. Um, so they have adjusted the timing of activities to respond to changes in the seasonality and safety of land, ice, and snow travel conditions. Summertime Arctic ship-based transportation has increased over the past two decades with sea ice reductions. This has implications for global trade, yes, but it also poses new risks to the Arctic marine ecosystems and coastal communities. When I was in Nome, just within a 24-hour period, two tourist uh, cruise ships came into port, having traversed from Greenland across the North Sea. Next slide. So. Um, just final slide for me, I, the you know, main takeaway from these messages, I think, is the more decisively and earlier we act, the more able we will be to address avoidable changes and manage the risks from climate change. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Whit. Thanks, Co. Uh, Bob? Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I was the former chair of the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, but what I'm going to talk about here is what came out of this rule. Co has actually covered it already in many respects. You've heard how we're changing the Earth's climate. It's becoming warmer, oceans are rising, sea ice is melting, the glaciers are melting, the oceans are becoming more acidic, we've got more persistent organic pollutants in the oceans, more heavy metals in the oceans, it's overfished most of the oceans, so we've got a problem. In fact, I just came back from an Arctic Forum meeting, a ministerial meeting, and the question they were posing is, is the melting of sea ice an opportunity or a threat to national security. And that is indeed the uh, dilemma these ministers, and they were foreign ministers that were there, uh, not environment ministers. But it's quite clear that since the 1950s, many marine species have undergone a shift in their geographic range and seasonal activities. Therefore, there's been a shift in both species composition in all parts of the world's oceans and the biomass productivity in each of these ecosystems. Also, we're getting different interactions now between species, and these are having cascading effects on both the structure and the functioning of these ecosystems. And just to put it in perspective, these ecosystem services are absolutely central to human well-being. 
There's been, a, as Co said, there's been a poleward shift in different marine species, both towards the north in the northern hemisphere, the south in the sun here. And since the 1950s, there's been shifts of up to about 50 kilometers per decade in organisms in the upper couple of hundred meters of the world's ocean, and about 30 kilometers uh, per decade for species on the sea floor. These are significant changes. Arctic primary production has clearly increased in the ice-free waters, and springtime phytoplankton blooms are occurring earlier in the year. Unfortunately, many associated marine mammals um, and seabirds uh, be, have it been very negatively affected uh, by effectively habitat contra contraction. Nearly 50% of coastal wetlands have been lost in the last 100 years, 50%. Changes in seagrass meadows and kelp, they're both expanding at high latitude, but they're contracting at low latitudes, basically. Uh, significant changes. Um, coral reefs, already very adversely affected by the changes we've already seen in that temperature more than anything else. But coral reefs are clearly one of the most vulnerable ecosystems in the world. They're sensitive to sea surface temperature. They're sensitive to a lesser degree of sea level rise. They're sensitive to ocean acidification. They're sensitive to land-based pollution. They're already in serious danger. And with these projected changes in temperature in the future, it is not, not unreasonable to say that coral reefs have a very low probability of surviving. What I like about this report is it did look at the full range of plausible temperature changes. The 1.5 degree uh, report looked at 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2. This report did look that we might potentially be on a much higher trajectory to a world that's 3, 4 and 5 degrees Celsius. And that's my personal view based on all the evidence we've got. The Paris Agreement is a superb agreement. The trouble is the current pledges are totally and utterly inadequate to meet a 1.5 world or a 2 degree world. We're much more likely to be on a pathway of 3 to 4 degrees world and this report actually plays out what are the implications of these higher changes in temperature and one of the most sensitive systems to these changes in temperature are indeed coral reefs when also affected by these other pressures as well. Since the 1980s, algae blooms, major range expansion, increased frequency. Um, I won't talk about fisheries, we're going to hear a much more profound talk in a few minutes basically. Um, there's no question that ocean acidification, um, along with warming sea, uh, sea ice changes and extent, continued loss of sea ice is really affecting the polar ecosystems in particular. Uh, it's one of the major issues that was talked at the Arctic Forum a couple of days ago. And of course, what it, and I'm sure you'll hear far more from the fisheries expert, and that is to what degree is this going to provide opportunities for now fishing in the Arctic region versus, as I said earlier, potential issues uh, that we have to look on that national security. But the key point that was talked about at that particular meeting and is raised in these reports is if one is now going to have far more exploitation of the natural resources that are now much more amenable to extraction, will it be done in a sustainable manner or will we continue in the totally unsustainable manner in the way we've exploited the world's oceans uh, to date, basically? And so fundamentally, uh, where are we? We're in trouble. It's very simple. Biodiversity is in trouble on the oceans, on land, everywhere. And these are not environmental issues. These are actually development issues, they're economic issues, they're security issues, they're moral issues, and they're, they're social issues. And in reality, the results are very similar thank goodness, uh, to the IPBES report that we put out in May of this year. As we basically said, marine biodiversity is uh, impacted at an unprecedented rate by human activities. 33% uh, of reef, coring, reef forming corals, sharks and shark relatives are all threatened now with extinction. Only 3% of the world's ocean is free 
from human pressure, 3% basically. Uh, globally, fish and exploitation has had the biggest impact on marine biodiversity, but climate is likely to be the dominant driver in the next few decades, which is why we have to look at climate change and biodiversity as one single issue. They cannot be looked at anymore as two separable issues. We've got to get the conventions to work together. And the key issue on all of these things is these are issues that affect all government departments. And the stovepiping of government departments and the stovepiping of UN, of UN agencies means that we, have a, we do not have have the right governance structures uh, to address these particular issues. And of course the other issue which comes out very nicely in this report is the emerging issue of plastics pollution, also a major threat to marine biodiversity. And with that all I can say is we need to act now. We should have acted 10, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I do have some slides. If it's possible to use them, that would be great. Um, so uh, thank you to WIT and to CSIS for the invitation. This is not my normal crowd. I come from NASA. Um, and so the, the very nature of what we do at NASA is that what's probably more well known are things like, um, you know, ex exploration of our solar system and beyond, the Mars rover. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, the more well-known Artemis program for looking at the moon and beyond. But we do also have part of our mission to explore the Earth, to understand the Earth, and to think about our observations, our models, and what we learn about the Earth in our research for not only basic and applied science, but for societal benefit. And we do this at NASA using an Earth-observing satellite fleet. Now, you may be thinking, what's the relevance to something like the IPCC report? We have 23 on-orbit missions, and as you can see from um, what's shown on the screen, a number of missions that are in formulation, in development, and some that have lasted long beyond their prime scheduled missions. And this becomes critical because if we actually want to look at the entire global Earth system and all of its aspects and look at the properties of the Earth system over time, then this is one way to do it. This is not the only way to do it. This is at a global scale and the partnership with the in-situ observations, which I have learned over time, sustained observations of anything are a very unsexy and difficult thing to sell. And where they come into play is when you have reports like the IPCC and you want to reduce uncertainties in your models. You need observations to do it. So these observations, as well as what our in-situ partners do, is absolutely critical. And we don't just use the um, low Earth orbit, we actually use our space station as well, okay? Owned and operated by a global community, peppered with Earth observing sensors, absolutely critical for getting a higher spatial, higher spectral, higher temporal resolution view of some of the Earth system. And this becomes very important when we think about reports like the IPCC. Now, I was tasked to talk to you about ocean production. And I, I wish that everybody in this room knew what that was or why they should care, but if you don't, I'm gonna tell you, okay? We're gonna walk through this. The ocean has what's known as food chains and of course a food web. And they're shown here in these photos. And I was highly sensitive to this photo because it's from Encyclopedia Britannica and there I just dated myself. Probably half the room doesn't remember what that is. Um, if you look at the right hand side, um, what you can look at are the producers right here on the bottom, the primary producers. In this case, we have a type of phytoplankton known as a dinoflagellate. Now, phytoplankton, what are they? Here are micrographs of, of uh, phytoplankton in the ocean, okay? These are the microscopic equivalent of land plants. Um, they go through and what's known as primary production through the process known as photosynthesis, where you take carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight, and you produce organic carbon and oxygen. And that's as sciencey as I'm gonna get with you right now. 
But why is that important? Because you just heard about from Co and from Bob, and you will hear from Kathy as well, um, details about carbon dioxide and what that does to Earth's climate and the impacts of that on everything living and things not living, okay? And why humans should care in the economics. So let's get to that. Who cares, okay, about these tiny little microscopic plants in the ocean? Well, phytoplankton are about one one hundredth of plant biomass. That's terrestrial plant biomass. Um, they conduct 50% of Earth's primary production with their biomass turning over in the ocean every two to six days. Now, how do you gauge change of something that turns over every two to six days, okay, and has that kind of impact on the global carbon cycle? It's challenging to observe, but it's possible. Phytoplankton mediate about one-third of human carbon dioxide emissions each year, okay? And now you should start to see even more why these organisms are very important in understanding our Earth system. So the economics of it. I just did a simple Google search of some UN reports yesterday and came up with tidbits referenced in recent UN reports. Um, you'll hear more about this in a moment, but fisheries and aquaculture support about 12% of the world's livelihoods. The ocean contributes greater than $282 billion to the U.S. GDP. The commercial value of U.S. fisheries from just coral reefs, just coral reefs, exceeds $100 million. And the U.S. harmful algal bloom events, as you just heard about from Bob, um, have an average impact of about $50 million each year based on the region that they're located in, okay? When you start to translate those numbers, and I, can, I footnoted them all in my notes, I can give you the UN reports. Um, that adds up to big business and why we should care even more deeply about something, not just for human well-being, but for our Earth system and our economics in general. Now, um, let's translate this even further. How do we do this from space? Some of the um, IPCC uh, analyses and modeling and conclusions are based on in situ as well as satellite data. And from space, this is what a phytoplankton bloom looks like, okay, right there. Um, the phytoplankton are responsible for going through photosynthesis and primary production, and this has a huge impact on regional and global carbon cycling. So it's these guys, again, at play, doing their thing, turning over every two to six days. Um, and remember, they, stay, they sustain higher trophic levels, so secondary production all the way up through fisheries and apex predators that humans are very familiar with and use for industry and economics, as well as sustenance, recreation, et cetera. Um, phytoplankton blooms, they change the color of the water. If there are more of them, you can see the water appeal, appears different colors, in this case greenish and milky white. Um, certain types of phytoplankton, which are indicators of climate change, such as coccolithophores and others, um, respond to different levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which are taken up by the ocean. Um, along with physical observations, okay, we can see a tight coupling between something like primary production and the physical state of the ocean. So we observe these variables together as the report points to. And then we can get things that are outcomes of changing the Earth system, meaning shifts in ecological species and a carbon balance. Um, if you change one thing in the system, it's likely that something else in the system is going to respond, and understanding those responses allow us to adapt. And for example, in this case, something like a coccolithophore uh, bloom, which is shown here, can do things like reduce water clarity effects, and that has an impact on local ecosystems, birds, fisheries, etc. So now, taking it all home, what we can do at NASA is do sustained observations of the global ocean, okay, and the Earth system in general. So what you're seeing here in this still shot, this is a composite of September 1997 at the start of a mission known as SeaWhips. Um, the color bar on the upper left-hand side shows you how much chlorophyll, which is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass, which is a major input to calculating production, is in the ocean. Um, the purples and darker blues are lower levels, and the greens and reds and yellows along the coast um, are the higher levels of phytoplankton. This can be coupled to something like the analog on the land, okay? In the upper right color bar, you see the land vegetation index. Now, where this becomes really powerful over time is that we can watch the Earth breathe, okay? So you are actually seeing monthly averages of what's going on in ocean phytoplankton biomass supporting uh, 
primary production and what's going on on the land over time. You can look at the Arctic and the Antarctic. You can see the snow cover and the ice cover, okay? You can see it change over time. You can look at areas like Africa and see the greening going on. You can see the deserts in brown. Um, you can see the lows in the central gyres. You can see the response of the ocean to things like El Nino and La Nina when they occur in uh, 97 and 98 was a big one at the start of this animation. Um, you can see changes in biomass and phytoplankton at the lower levels. So when you start to take some of the impacts that Co has talked about and Bob has talked about with increased stratification, um, and you think about your phytoplankton in the ocean and production and how important it is, if you think of your houseplants at home, what do they need to grow? They need water, not so limiting in the ocean. They need sunlight and they need nutrients. And when you have effects like heating, warming, stratification, all of a sudden production becomes a real challenge and that's gonna affect your higher trophic levels. It's also gonna impact things like harmful algal blooms and where and when they occur. Uh, so it's a very dynamic system, and those changes over time are really important to identify with some critical observations. So, sorry, with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy to tell you more about fisheries. Thanks, Paul. All right. I also have slides. Um, hopefully they can get queued up. So I'm Kathy Mills. I'm a scientist at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in Portland, Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is actually one of the fastest warming regions in the world's oceans. Since we sort of realized how rapidly the Gulf of Maine was warming, a lot of my research has focused on how these warming patterns are affecting fish populations, fisheries, and fishing communities. And I'm here today to share with you some of the experiences related to fisheries um, in the Northeast US and hopefully using these examples to demonstrate that the findings and the key messages that are coming out of the special report on oceans and cryosphere are not just far away and far into the future. They are messages that are relevant here and they're relevant now. We're already seeing a lot of these changes occurring in fisheries in the Northeast US. Um, so I am going to, in my talk today, attempt to highlight a few examples related to some of the key themes in this report. And I thought this report does an excellent job of highlighting some of the physical changes we're seeing in the ocean, particularly that the ocean is warming, warming rates are increasing, and marine heat waves are increasing in frequency. And then also calling out, and we've heard from a number of these speakers, how those changes are affecting the ecosystem through changes in species um, patterns, ecosystem services, including fisheries, and how those affect people on the ground and, and communities. And then I will conclude with a little bit of touching on some of the challenges we're seeing in fishery management systems, governance, and adaptation challenges. So just to orient you to some of the warming that we are experiencing in the Gulf of Maine, this is a time series of our sea surface temperature anomalies back to the start of the satellite sea surface temperature record. And what you see here is that we have been experiencing a warming trend over time. The overall trend that I show in this figure is that the Gulf of Maine is warming about 0 0.04 degrees Celsius per year. That doesn't sound like a lot probably, but the global warming average for sea surface temperature is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius per year. So we're warming about four times faster, and in fact faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. And heat waves have also become something that we are seeing frequently in the Gulf of Maine, the northeast shelf of the United States. I think that um, in 2012, we experienced a major heat wave that spanned the Northwest Atlantic. And I think that our work around this heat wave was actually the first time the word heat wave was used in association with ocean and marine settings. And essentially, during this event, we saw temperatures running two to three degrees warmer than the long-term average, all the way from Cape um, Hatteras in North Carolina over to Iceland and all the way north into the Labrador Sea. During that summer, the Gulf of Maine uh, experienced temperatures that were about three degrees warmer than the long-term average through that year. Um, and we've also seen heat wave events for substantial portions of 2016 and 2018 since that time. <clears throat> 
So the warming trend, as well as the heat waves, um, all have ramifications for species in the ecosystem. And I'm going to go through a few examples of changes that we're seeing to fish populations and what that means for fisheries in the region. The example I'm going to start with is Gulf of Maine cod. So cod has historically been a really important fishery. It's sort of the fishery at the heart of New England. It was the commodity that supported the colonial economy, and fishing on cod has persisted for centuries. Over that time, we have certainly experienced periods of overfishing on cod, but in recent years, the fishery management systems that we've put in place have really reined in overfishing, and what we have seen in more recent years, though, is that climate is throwing a new wrench into fishery management and introducing new challenges. So in the way that we do fisheries management, we um, take observations of fish in the ecosystem and put those together to try to develop an estimate of how large the population is. And with Gulf of Maine cod, this process doesn't typically account for environmental conditions. But with cod, what we've seen is that not accounting for temperature really led to major challenges in terms of how we assess the state of the stock and manage it and uh, allowable levels of fishing on that stock. So by not accounting for the rapid warming that we have seen in the Gulf of Maine, we were not picking up on declines in recruitment of cod that were tied to that warming trend. And we were assuming that the stock could be fished harder than it could in reality. So even though the management system was operating within the bounds of scientific information it was provided, and fishers on the water were operating under those rules, the stock has been overfished in recent years because we aren't accounting for some of the major changes that are occurring in the ocean. When we look forward into the future under a variety of temperature scenarios, and here the warm scenario we're using is roughly equivalent to the RCP 8.5 temperatures, and the hot scenario is actually aligned with the temperature warming rates that we have been experiencing in the region in recent years. What we see is that when we project um, the population out to the future, under some temperature conditions, we do expect the stock to recover to what we consider a sustainable level, but that's with no fishing happening on the stock. And under the warmest condition that we simulated, which is on par with our recent warming rates, um, we actually can't recover this stock to what we would consider a sustainable level. So this points to both the need for um, considering how we keep temperatures within reasonable biological realms, which gets at mitigation needs, but then also how we manage to support stocks that are operating under different um, and new um, physical conditions. So the future of cod in the Gulf of Maine will depend both on fishing rates, fishing levels, and temperature. I also want to describe a little bit about our experiences with American lobster. So American lobster increasing while the population in southern New England is declining. Did that help at all? <laughs> it's on? Okay. Well, I'll just keep going. Um, so hold it closer. Got it. All right. So we have seen contrasting patterns in the Gulf of Maine and southern New England. And through some modeling work that we've done, essentially what we're seeing in southern New England is that temperatures are exceeding thresholds that lobster can tolerate. So the actual temperatures that they are experiencing are contributing to the decline of that population. Whereas in the Gulf of Maine, we've really moved into a sweet spot of temperatures that are really encouraging lobster production right now. Um, so the Gulf of Maine is benefiting from this warming in terms of its ability to produce lobsters, but looking forward as temperatures continue to increase, that may not be the continued pattern. 
And I do want to highlight, because it comes out in the special report on oceans and cryosphere, the interconnections between climate and non-climate factors. So in this work as well, we also looked at um, some of the management approaches that have been used for lobster in the different regions. In the Gulf of Maine, for over a century, there's been a practice of marking um, female lobsters that have eggs and throwing them back. So a, a strong conservation ethic to return these females so that they can continue producing future generations of lobster. And what we looked at was if we had not had that practice in the Gulf of Maine, but had applied that practice in southern New England, how would these populations look now? And what we see here essentially, do I have a pointer? Um, is that if the Gulf of Maine had fished on those larger female lobsters, the population would have been lower than it is in actuality. Whereas in southern New England, if those large um, female lobsters had been protected, the population could have been doing much better than it currently is. So these issues are intertwined and uh, need to be sort of factored together with one another. And I also, um, I don't have a slide for this, but since we have talked a bit about heat waves, I do want to mention that the 2012 heat wave that we experienced had major ramifications for the lobster fishery. During that year, the temperatures warmed up earlier than usual. Lobster landing started coming online really early, but what we saw was a breakdown in the supply chain beyond that point. So there wasn't capacity in place to truck the lobsters to processors. There um, was an overlap between the American and Canadian lobster season that year. So it resulted in a glut of products sitting on the market. And in fact, a backlog even at the processing stage that led to a major price collapse. And this was an event that really triggered a change in the conversation around what's going on with warming and climate change in New England. And so I do want to highlight that even though I don't have it in my slides. Um, and then the last example I want to offer you is that we are experiencing changes in species distributions. In general, many species in the Northeast are moving northward and to deeper waters as they try to track um, cooler temperatures. This is affecting fisheries as well. So here I'm showing you in the map um, a figure for where summer flounder are being caught. And what you see in blue is essentially that in the 1990s, summer flounder were being caught off of North Carolina and Virginia. How, however, in the around 2010, those summer flounder catches were taking a place off of New Jersey and Long Island. So the fishery has shifted as the stock has shifted. And this type of pattern playing out across many species is also the uh, also creates the potential that new opportunities could arise as species move into waters that they haven't previously occupied but this is where how we govern fisheries comes into play so for summer flounder and for several species along the east coast of the US we use a process where the overall allowable catch is proportioned out to states so states um, are given certain shares of the quota based on their historical landings in the fishery. For summer flounder, these levels were set based on landings in the 1980s. And we didn't design a system that would plan for change in the future. We use similar types of systems for multinational arrangements for sharing the, sh the catch um, between countries. So this is a system that is currently um, sort of breaking down as we see shifts in fisheries or shifts in species and it has a lot of implications for adaptation um, to the changes that are occurring. So I'm going to end just with a few comments related to um, one focus place, Stonington, Maine. Stonington is the most valuable port in Maine right now. It lands 50 to 60 million dollars worth of lobster every year and most of the landings there are indeed just lobster, about 99 percent of landings. In Stonington, what we see when we look to the future is that we expect those lobster, um, the availability of lobster to decline by about 20%. There are new species moving in, like black sea bass and long fin squid. So really the future of Stonington as a fishing community will be shaped by the ability to tap into some of the resources that are moving into waters that they currently fish. And that gets back to our ability to create governance arrangements that would support that adaptation. But I do want to highlight that the future of Stonington is not just about its ability to adapt to fisheries on the water. 
Looking at the prospect for a 20% decline in lobster has major ramifications for the tax base of this place. Um, at the same time that they're confronting a variety of adaptation needs and infrastructure investments. One of the issues is sea level rise, particularly because Stonington is connected to the mainland by a low-lying causeway. So the future of fisheries in Stonington isn't just about adjusting to the species available. It's also going to be tied to the ability to preserve shoreside infrastructure and the transportation network. And so thinking about adaptation in more holistic manners that does doesn't silo issues, uh, and integrating those together, I think, is a realm that we haven't really tackled in our approach in the past, and it's an approach that we need to invest in much more heavily moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we've uh, our late bell mics on. So <clears throat> we had a <clears throat> really great, compelling conversation about uh, what the IPCC report has to say with regard to uh, coming impacts and about how those impacts translate into ecosystem change. And uh, I wanted to touch on a little bit uh, something I think that um, is there but maybe gets lost in the dynamic of conversation around different pathways, mitigation pathway, uh, business as usual pathway. And, that said, even under the most optimistic scenario, uh, we've really locked ourselves into decades, and in some cases, centuries of change, depending on the kind of factor that we're talking about. And so I guess this is a, a question just to the panel generally, which is maybe you could comment a little bit about on how we've moved beyond the steady state, and how, uh, from your perspective, we're going to continue to see change, even under the most optimistic scenario, and what that might look like uh, in the coming decades. And I'll, I'll just ask anybody who wants to just sort of take a stab at that. Well, as I said, um, the Paris Agreement, which was endorsed by literally every country in the world, including the US, is on paper a superb agreement. It argues that we should keep global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius and try and achieve 1.5. Unfortunately, all the evidence is such that we're not on that pathway now, that we are clearly on a pathway to 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. Even a 1.5 or a 2 degree world has significant impacts on marine biodiversity, fisheries and the terrestrial system. We're focusing here on the ocean, but the terrestrial implications of a 1.5 and 2 degree world are still quite bad, a 3 to 4 degree world. Therefore, we have to put as much effort on adaptation to these changes as we do uh, to mitigating change. But we've really got to get government working with the private sector, working with civil society, to realize that there are incredible opportunities for transformational change to make our carbon system low carbon, to try to get close to the Paris Agreement. But as I say, we equally at the same time have to learn how to adapt to a changing climate. And I think this is going to be a real challenge, to be quite candid. Um, in bio biodiversity terms, ecological terms, it's the rate of change that's going to make adaptation so incredibly hard. Not just the magnitude, but the rate of change. And we're going to see further changes lost in both terrestrial biodiversity and in marine biodiversity. And as I've said, the problem is these are not simply uh, environmental issues. I, in some ways, I wish they were. These are development issues. They affect, f uh, they affect food, water security, human health, migration patterns of people being displaced by sea level rise around the world. So you bring in social conflict, even potentially armed conflict. So we really do need to recognize that economic issues as well. Climate change causes significant economic costs, actually. Loss of biodiversity causes economic loss. And as I say, it's a security issue. So I think the challenge in front of us, however, what I would say is I think most governments do now realize this where we're failing is implementation because of vested interests uh, trying to control and like the status quo that we have today. But we also have to think across government departments. 
all government departments have to work together on these issues, all UN agencies, and we have to work with the private sector. So it's a major challenge, but it's doable. Both IPCC and IPBES, we've laid down what are the technologies, what are the policy changes, uh, evolution of an economic system, basically, getting rid of perverse subsidies in transportation, energy, fisheries, for example. So it's doable. We just need to have the political will. I would also add, building off of your comment about the rate of change and its importance for biodiversity, I think the rate of change is also the real sort of key element for adaptation of human systems as well. I mean, we see that in many cases, people can cope with change, but only to a certain point. And being able to move beyond that, I think um, humans only have the capacity to adjust so quickly in terms of how they do things. And we really need to think about putting governance and management systems in place that can inherently accommodate the dynamics of the ecosystem um, without needing to renegotiate the terms of an agreement every single time there is a change. I think we're moving into a new era where um, we're seeing change happen so quickly that building systems that inherently accommodate that change is going to be really important moving forward. I think that's a great point. It's one I kind of wanted to get to. You talked about how our management structures here in the U.S., where we have the best managed fisheries in the world, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, are not able to account for a dynamic environment where we have fisheries not just migrating. It's not like they're migrating to an endpoint. They are going to continue to move as the climate continues to change in the coming decades. So, <clears throat> to your point, the idea that we need to build systems and institutions that are themselves dynamic, are able to deal uh, not just in a steady state sort of way, but with the changing status quo. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Bob, you talked a lot about uh, biodiversity uh, and, and how that uh, climate is going to become the, the biggest driver for biodiversity loss in the coming decades. Can you talk a little bit about the feedback loop between biodiversity and resilience to change and sort of how there's there's a, a, a real negative impact, not just from the loss of biodiversity on existing ecosystem services, but on the ability to withstand change. I'm not quite sure what you're looking at, but there's no question that as we're losing biodiversity, we are losing resilient systems. There's no question at all about that, both terrestrial biosphere and the marine biosphere, that these are fragile systems. And the problem is, once you lose biodiversity, it's irreplaceable, basically. So, we've, I mean, what this is obviously both marine and terrestrial, but in IPBES, we actually said that one million species out of eight million species were at threat of extinction. That's a huge number. It's not a sixth mass extinction like a lot of people say it is, because on that, we lost 75% of species in the historical past. But the trouble is, as you lose individual species, you change the interaction between the species, and it actually very much changes the dynamics, the resilience of the systems, the ecosystem services they provide to us human, human people. And so we have to basically try to see how do you keep these ecosystems intact People tend to fo focus a lot on individual species, but the big challenge is keeping the ecosystems intact, uh, especially terrestrial ecosystems. So fundamentally, we have a major challenge. But as I've said, there are practices and technologies that can address these issues in a fairly straightforward way. Can, can I just add, Please. I mean, there really <coughs> is a moral dilemma here as well. I, in my day job, um, I have a program under my jurisdiction that's based on, it looks at ocean exploration. We are still discovering new species, mm. you know, every time we go out with a, you know, an exploration um, tour. So um, the disruption to the systems that we still don't even fully understand is, I think, a travesty that has to be considered. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for some audience questions, and so I guess do we have mics? So what I'd like to do is actually, given that we have a sh relatively short period of time for the coffee break, maybe we could take, uh, let's say, three questions, and we'll go to the panel with those three questions, try and keep them brief uh, and, and as much to a, a question as possible. Um, so I see one person up here, uh, two people up here, and is there a third? One over there. And then one over there. So Ty, maybe you could pass the mic around. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ling Xing. I'm a graduate student from- It's not on. Is this better? Yeah, better. Okay, Thank beautiful. You. 
Um, I'm a graduate student from Johns Hopkins University studying engineering and international relations. Thank you very much for your sharing. And there's a very insightful point during your um, discussion about how this climate uh, change is a systematic manner. And one of you mentioned how political governments can make a big difference. But here's my question. Please bear with me. I, I'm just curious to know, and I want to push forward a little bit. Like, instead of discussing the impacts, uh, maybe you, you already have the solutions and approaches to address this problem. But is it possible that we can utilize what poses as challenge right here into actually an advantage? Let's say because the heat waves, right, is one of the biggest uh, negative impact that comes along with the, um, climate global warming. But is it possible that we can transfer this thermal um, energy into something that we can, as a usable energy. And also because also this lady, she mentions at the NASA's, there, uh, NASA, there would be lots of work on the um, plants or, you know, like ba um, bacteria, uh, bacteria, like a microwave, you know, like the agents that can transform the carbon dioxide and the sunlight into the oxygen and the carbohydrate complexes. So with the emerging synthetic biology and gene editing techniques as well, is it possible that we can you know, utilize some of the bacteria or the plants that is sensitive to this heat or sensitive to this warming um, temperature you know, to actually to do something good and transfer all this carbon dioxide into the oxygen? Thank you. Okay, great. Maybe you could pass it. Yes. <coughs> Tie right up here in the front. <clears throat> I'm Steve Parks, a uh, retired physicist. Uh, I've been uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, regulatory issues about surrounding the littoral zones and how development processes in both Europe and the U.S. and probably everywhere else uh, has put a great deal of pressure on the nursery areas where pelagic fishes uh, fry, develop, and uh, how, how does this affect the fisheries, and what do you think can be done to enhance the preservation of these, because the rising <coughs> sea levels will push the uh, marshlands back but the cities will, will block that progress. <coughs> and uh, so you'll end up with uh, some limitations and reduction of those marshlands. Okay, thank you. And then one more over here. Uh, thank you, Matthew Kupchik. I'm a AAAS SDP fellow at USAID. Um, you spoke on, on the need to come up with transformative ways to manage our fisheries better, essentially, in light of these challenges. And I know there's been a push to ecosystem-based management of fisheries, going back to this thing. But if we're actually changing the baselines and we're changing the distributional ranges, how do we then basically have a moving system, right? The, 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 the ecosystem's yeah. moving across exactly. the, 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 the space. And you're going to have to have a management system then that has to go transboundary, dealing with Absolutely. Maybe even rethinking Absolutely. the law of the sea and the EEZ yep. to be able to, to come to those challenges. If you could speak to that, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, really good question. So, I'm going to just summarize quickly. I think we had one about the opportunities. There's always winners and losers in any uh, changing system uh, coming with climate change. One about the challenge uh, having to do with, I think I'm going to summarize it by saying the loss of coastal ecosystems and the tension between the need to adapt. Uh, coastal infrastructure and, and, and the loss of coastal ecosystems and the impacts that'll have. And then the third, which is diving a little more into the nature of, of the challenges around building a dynamic management system, especially when it, it, it comes with uh, international uh, and intergovernmental relationships. So I'll toss that to the panel. Anybody can dive in on any one of those. Um, well, I can probably start on the engineering and you know, physics is sort of where I sit, but the um, I, every time that there's a, you know, a report, uh, an assessment, a recommendation, an idea about um, engineering of some sort coming mm. to the rescue of any sort of climate challenge, we read it with great interest. Now, NASA is not mm -hmm. a policy institution, right? We're, we're more on the R&D side and engineering side. But there have been reports on you know, geoengineering. Can we do things with it? People study biofuels. People study all sorts of alternatives. And I think it's good to encourage that. I have yet to see you know, a proposed idea or solution that really 
understands um, the Earth system or an ecosystem as a whole and takes every aspect into account before implementing everything. Um, it's kind of like, you know, before you flip that switch that you may not be able to flip back and changing something or introducing a species into an ecosystem that may ultimately decimate it for a short-term fix. Um, I think we have to have a better understanding of all the aspects of an ecosystem and what the long-term um, uh, implications of something like that is. Because you can draw, you know, you can um, dump a bunch of iron into the ocean, draw down CO2, but most models show it's back in the atmosphere Doesn't within work. 40 or 50 years. Okay, so yes. short-term fix, um, you know, long-term problem. I don't know if... Kathy? I saw so you uh, thinking a little bit about some of the, the management system issues. I can comment on the fishery questions. The first question, I'm glad that Paula could tackle the <laughs> physics of that. Um, so I think that, you know, to the couple of questions related to fish, um, obviously the question about nursery habitats is really important. Um, we recognize that those are sort of in critical habitat areas for many fish species that do then go on to either provide important prey in the ecosystem or to support fisheries directly. I would say, and this is something I've been interested for a while but haven't been able to move down the path of, that um, we don't have a lot of information on how that habitat area and quality scales up to a population level and the ramifications beyond that. So without that framework in place, it's really hard to determine if you see changes in aggregate area or location of different areas, how that will affect populations at a higher level. And so I think this is a, a science gap that will be an important area to address moving forward, particularly as we see distributions changing as well. Do you guys want to add anything to that one? No, I'm sure she's <laughs> All right. What about the idea that international institutions need to, need to adapt? So international institutions need to adapt and, and oh. how, we, how we think about uh, our relationships across EEZs and, and across boundaries? Well, there's no question whether it's a climate change issue or biodiversity issue, and as I say, I think they're one issue now. We need institutions and organizations to adapt both nationally and internationally. There's no question whatsoever about that. We don't have the right institutional organizational structures at either the national level or the international level. So when we say transformative change is needed, one of those transformative changes is in governance structures, basically. But the basic problem is there's no trust. There's limited trust between governments, developed and developed, let alone developed and developing, limited trust between governments and the private sector and the NGOs. And still, until we all recognize we have a major challenge for the survival of Earth and we need to work together, we're not going to address these issues, to be quite honest. So trust and building trust is going to be a crucial issue. One quick question on the geoengineering of biofuels. Another reason we have to look at climate change and biodiversity, literally every large scale climate model that says we have a chance of getting to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius relies very heavily on using bioenergy, mm -hmm. often coupled with what's called carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, if you do go to large scale monoculture bioenergy, it potentially could threaten biodiversity if you're replacing a monoculture, a native forest or native grassland with a monoculture, or if you encroach on arable land, you threaten food and water security, which is why you need to look at the issues together. Some bioenergy can be good, but it has to be handled carefully. We have to look at the synergies and the trade-offs in all of the solution space, both technologies, policies and practices between issues such as climate change and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are coupled together. They can't be looked at one at a time. And on the geoengineering, we need to do a lot more research to understand the potential benefits and the potential risks. And we clearly should not be trying to geoengineer a world that we can't even understand at the moment. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys so much. I'd, I'd like to break there for our, our coffee break. Make sure we do have some time to, to get some coffee. Thank you all. Really appreciate you joining us here today. And I look forward to getting to some uh, of these questions in the next panel as well. So thank you. Sitting on my wire.
Coming back uh, promptly from the coffee break, I really appreciate it. And um, thanks again to our first panel, really enjoyed the, the conversation. So uh, I think we're gonna pick up a little bit on, on some of the themes from the end of that conversation around this idea of, of a dynamic world and what that means now in the policy and the security space. So I'm really excited to have an excellent panel to talk about that. Uh, we've got Heather Conley, who's our Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. We've got John Mimikakis, who is the Vice President for Oceans at the Environmental Defense Fund. We've got Sarah Glasser, who is the Deputy Director of Secure Fisheries. And we've got uh, Amy Lair, who is the Director of our Human Rights Initiative here at CSIS. So again, thank you to the panel. And I'm going to uh, sit down and be quiet and turn it over to my excellent panel. Uh, and we'll start off with Heather. Well, Whit, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I think the Arctic is the best place to talk about that intersection of climate stress and security. Um, and in many ways, the Arctic is telling us, actually both polar regions are telling us that they are under the most dramatic stress, as the Arctic certainly is warming two to three times faster than any place on the planet. And in many ways, we are now dealing with a very new ocean. In fact, our former uh, Coast Guard Commandant, Admiral Zunkoff, called the Arctic America's fourth coast. And I thought that was such a powerful way of thinking about it, in part because many Americans do not know the United States is an Arctic nation, to help bring it home to this is homeland security. Uh, we now have a new coast that requires our protection. And so that is what, in many ways, the, the nexus between the rapid diminishment of the Arctic uh, polar ice cap is now creating new borders, new coasts to protect. Uh, which is why we need uh, enhanced Coast Guard presence. Certainly that's through uh, the uh, enhanced icebreaker uh, component, uh, what we call a polar security cutter. Um, but this was also require deep water ports, greater mar uh, maritime domain awareness because we are now seeing an increase in commercial and human activity um, in the Arctic. It is also this new ocean and the opportunities that this new ocean provides uh, is really uh, requiring a much more a rethought, I, I would argue, about sovereignty in the Arctic. And this is certainly the Russian government's perspective uh, because they are now, Russia is now uh, developing a very ambitious economic development plan for the Russian Arctic which not only includes the development of oil and gas resources in the Russian Arctic, but also the creation of a major transit route, the Northern Sea Route. And so what we're seeing is Russia needing to enhance the protection of the Northern Sea Route. They're reopening airfields, they're putting search and rescue centers across the Northern Sea Route, uh, and they are also making important changes uh, to uh, the structure and how they regulate the Northern Sea Route. And of course, what underpins all of this, uh, uh, both the science and the environmental change that we're seeing in the Arctic, as well as the economics, it's all underpinned by science. Science is power in the Arctic. Using traditional knowledge of the indigenous communities is power. Um, and of course, we're trying to understand the science behind the extraordinary changes that we are seeing in the Arctic. So I'm just gonna touch on some of the key security issues. It's sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will. Um, and there is some very good things that are happening in the Arctic to manage this nexus between climate stress and security. First and foremost, I think at this point, the Arctic is well governed. The United Nations uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea provides that maritime space with good legal frameworks for territorial waters, exclusive economic zones, as well as the high seas area around the North Pole, the Central Arctic Ocean. And one of the most important forms of monitoring and, and innovating uh, governing the Arctic is through the Arctic Council, that intergovernmental forum that was created in 1996. It was birthed from an Arctic environmental protection strategy that brings the five coastal states together, Russia, Canada, Norway, Denmark, uh, the Kingdom of Denmark via Greenland, and of course the United States, plus Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. But what's so important about the Arctic Council that sort of gets missed uh, is that at the center of the Arctic Council are the indigenous communities, the permanent participants. 
they have a seat at the table because it's their way of life that is so dramatically changing. But the Arctic Council has been sort of groaning under the changes, both of the, the climate change and the new demands on it. Uh, right now, there are 20 plus observers to the Arctic Council. In 2013, China became a permanent observer to the Arctic Council, and I would argue that very much changed the dynamic. Uh, now the Arctic is not just for those regional countries. Uh, it is now becoming a global issue because what happens in the Arctic impacts the global environment. And as China's role became more and more apparent in the Arctic and Russia began to assert itself increasingly, both militarily and economically in the Arctic, now we're at a point where we're, we're viewing the Arctic through the lens of great power competition. And that was certainly framed by uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Finland uh, in May of this year, where he gave a real stem winder of a speech, sort of surprised some of us uh, where it came from, describing this very stark uh, great power competition in the Arctic. And so that's in some ways what we're grappling with today. China's growing economic presence uh, through infrastructure, uh, through its participation in a variety of international organizations, uh, and of course Russia's increased uh, military presence. These are challenging how the U.S. thinks about it. But I always want to end with good news because so often in our line of work we're just talking about challenges. Uh, I want to say I, uh, the Arctic has also demonstrated great resilience and in governance innovation. When we needed to strengthen uh, the, the, the maritime shipping code in the Arctic, the International Maritime Organization, it took it a decade, created the Polar Code, which strengthens uh, uh, demands and mandates that ships must be uh, hardened uh, for traversing the Arctic. We've created an international search and rescue agreement, an international oil spill and response agreement. We have just recently negotiated a preemptive fisheries agreement for the Central Arctic Ocean. There are no fish in the Central Arctic Ocean, but this agreement puts a moratorium on that for 16 years until the science tells us uh, that it could be okay if we needed to do that. Uh, we have innovations like the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which helps do that search and rescue, that oil spill response. And finally, something that Witt and I have been looking at is getting to that high seas challenge to protect the biodiversity beyond the national jurisdictions, beyond the exclusive economic zones that's targeting those high seas area, fisheries, biodiversity, shipping. You know what, it's a little chaotic right now. I don't think we have it all exactly the right place. I'm very worried about the military dimension. I'm worried about China's dual use uh, infrastructure in the Arctic, but I'm very heartened when I see innovation, pragmatic governance that's helping to protect the Arctic. So I wanna end on a high note, but looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Good. Witt. Thank you, Heather, that's, that's great. Um, so we're gonna turn now from the Arctic to uh, Asia and the Pacific, and I'm gonna to turn to John. Thanks, Witt. Um, so I'm, uh, Asia is uh, very much a crucible for climate change uh, and security. Um, if you think about it, it's got two thirds of the global population. Uh, many of those are poor populations. Uh, they live coastally uh, predominantly. They rely heavily on seafood uh, for uh, nutrition. Um, uh, there's already uh, over-exploitation of those fishing resources and that over-exploitation is intensifying. Um, the governments typically have low capacity to deal with those issues. And then these, uh, in Southeast Asia especially, uh, these are the countries that are going to be hit hardest uh, by climate change where some of those impacts will be felt the greatest. Um, to talk about this and put this in a little bit of context, I want to use uh, Indonesia as an example. I'll start with that and then I'll try to, to, to back up a little bit. So Indonesia <clears throat> um, is the second largest uh, fishing power in the world in, in terms of uh, amount of wild fish harvested. China's the first, obviously, Indonesia's second. Uh, but it's a country that struggled uh, with poverty. It has about a 10% uh, poverty rate. Um, uh, of its 270 million people, 10% uh, live below the poverty line, which Indonesia is about 76 cents uh, a day. Um, the uh, fishing is often referred to as a last resort occupation. When ag uh, agriculture and other jobs don't work out, you can just go fishing. Um, uh, and so many of these coastal communities depend upon fish uh, for nutrition uh, and for uh, and to climb out of poverty. 
uh, as uh, and if you uh, if you're if you're not certain how important fisheries are to Indonesia, Google uh, Minister Susi Pujiastuti, and I'm sure you will uh, pull up a, uh, a photograph of, of the uh, the boats, the fishing boats that have illegally traversed into Indonesia fishing waters that uh, that she's blown up literally, and it made her uh, it's made her one of the most popular uh, politicians in Indonesia today. Um, as an example of the role that fisheries play. Um, I can tell you a little bit about a blue swimming crab fishery that uh, EDF works in there. Um, it's the third most uh, important uh, export commodity economically, uh, uh, swimming crab. If you go to the Chesapeake here and you order a crab cake sandwich, uh, chances are the local, uh, local supply can't really keep up with the demand, so chances are very, very good that you are eating uh, blue swimming crab from Indonesia. Um, and perhaps one from the, uh, from the Java Sea. 80% 80, 80 of the product there goes to the U.S. Um, there are about 300 people uh, in that fishery uh, in terms of fishermen and, uh, and supply chain workers there, uh, and it brings in the country about 300 million U.S. dollars. So 300,000 uh, people, $300 million, if you do the math, that keeps these people just above that poverty line, but only hovering just above it. So they remain very vulnerable. Uh, climate change uh, impacts will be very serious uh, for communities like these. Um, obviously, sea level rise. Uh, some of these communities not, are not just coastal. Uh, there is a uh, there is a fishing village uh, that uh, that we work with that is literally built on a sandbar about 10 kilometers from shore with uh, sticks sort of put down in the in the uh, in the sand and, and there's a platform and. Uh, women and children, but mostly uh, fishermen are, are there and they live there uh, year round so they can get further uh, access uh, to the fishery. Obviously, sea level rise is, is going to be extremely, extremely challenging. Um, uh, but the losses in productivity that you heard about in the, in the first panel, uh, what we heard globally, uh, uh, the earth, you know, global fish production may decline by about 4% or so. Uh, but regionally, uh, losses in the developing tropics in places like Indonesia could decline by as much as 50%. Uh, and that's both because of the loss in fundamental productivity uh, that the previous speakers talked about, and also because of fish migrating uh, to cooler waters uh, and poleward, northward and, uh, and, and southward. Um, so this is, of course, uh, potentially catastrophic uh, for these poor communities that are hovering on the poverty line. Um, and, and this generates a, um, this will create a potentially uh, downward spiral. So if there's a loss of catch, um, the res logical response for most communities is to then fish harder. Uh, that then makes um, these fisheries even more vulnerable to climate change. So there's a very interesting link to understand here, and it's talked about in the report. Uh, overfished fisheries are more vulnerable to climate change. And climate change, of course, will have a negative impact on fisheries. So these communities uh, that experience drops in catches uh, will then make their own resources more vulnerable by overfishing. The governments uh, in many of these places have little capacity to control that. Um, and so these communities uh, have the potential to spiral downward. Another response to declining catches will be for fishermen to go further and further abroad. Already, many Indonesian fishermen go right up to the border of the EEZ of Australia, and they fish right along the line, uh, because Australia's fisheries are well, fairly well managed, and Indonesian fishermen just sort of get the benefits right over the border. And I'm not trying to pick on Indonesia. We've seen China do the same thing as their domestic fisheries have dropped. Uh, they've uh, increased uh, the, the, uh, the power and number of uh, distant water fleet uh, boats. Um, and this, of course, creates huge uh, challenges in Asia where the EEZs are packed in uh, so, so tightly uh, that it will create uh, a, a lot of potential for tensions to grow among uh, countries. Um, so turning to solutions, uh, what can we do about this? Uh, it, the number one solution, of course, is to mitigate uh, climate change, uh, to reduce uh, carbon pollution and global warming pollution, number one. Uh, since we're on an ocean theme, number two, I would say, is to uh, uh, promote low carbon energy, uh, wind energy, uh, wave energy, perhaps thermal uh, water energy as well. Uh, solutions that promote blue carbon. Um, uh, it's, it's the, the report talks uh, well, speaks well to the issue of uh, mangroves, salt marshes, seagrasses, uh, 
Um, but there's also the carbon that's found in uh, increasing fish stocks, uh, re reviving those to historic levels. There was a paper I saw recently by some economists that estimated that if you could replenish whale populations, whale populations alone to pre-fished levels, that's two gigatons of carbon. Um, so that's a pretty startling number. Uh, another potential way to mitigate is to eat more fish. This may sound a little controversial. We can talk about it in the Q&A. But uh, uh, beef, beef uh, is about 20 times uh, more emissions per gram of protein uh, in a life cycle analysis than, uh, than seafood. OK, but critically, as we heard in the last panel, uh, we cannot just mitigate. We also need to adapt and manage. And this is a really uh, urgent issue uh, because of this linked link between uh, uh, fisheries abundance and resiliency. We really, uh, it's urgent that we put in place uh, good fisheries management in these countries that lack it. Uh, so this is a food security issue. So number one, we need to build capacity in these countries that don't have the skills, finances, or expertise or experience to put in place management. Uh, and number two, we need to strengthen international agreements because if, as these fish migrate, uh, the countries uh, uh, that host fish that are leaving uh, have every incentive to fish those populations down before they get across the border. And uh, the, the countries that might receive the fish are not going to want that to happen. So there really needs to be uh, what we know again and again from uh, observing fisheries around the world. When there's unmanaged competition, it leads to a decline in the fish population. So there really needs to be a new effort to uh, strengthen these international agreements. There are many international agreements on fisheries. Uh, almost none of them contain climate uh, provisions. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we need to develop solutions uh, for some of these local communities, uh, like aquaculture, uh, blue carbon, and perhaps uh, some energy solutions as well. So there needs to be new, new solutions like that that can provide income and nutrition uh, for these communities. There is hope. Um, there are good examples. Uh, Witt earlier mentioned that the U.S. fisheries are one of the best managed in the world. It's one of the greatest conservation success stories I think that almost no one's heard of is the turnaround in U.S. fisheries. So management really can lead to fisheries rebounding. It's not just the U.S., of course. Uh, Australia has done this. New Zealand has done this. Namibia, uh, Chile, and Peru. There are good examples around the world of solutions that can work to rebuild fish populations. And again, this increases resiliency of the oceans to climate change. Uh, in Asia, there is some hope as well. Japan, uh, last December, passed its most significant reforms to its fishing law since World War II. Uh, and even China has now been implementing some pretty dramatic reforms to control overfishing and overexploitation of aquaculture in its domestic waters. Uh, so there's a lot happening. Uh, if, uh, if countries gather together, I think, and promote aid to these countries to build capacity uh, and can share their experiences, uh, can share their experts, their technical expertise, and uh, most importantly, share their financial resources. I think there's hope to, uh, to avoid the worst of climate change for these uh, countries in Southeast Asia. Excellent. Thank you. Sarah, maybe you can talk, talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> the Indo and Indo-Pacific and maybe uh, East Africa. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm talking primarily about Africa and the Indian Ocean. Um, and I think John provided an ex excellent segue into what is happening in countries around Africa and um, the adaptive capacity that needs to be built. That, I, I agree completely that in um, countries that are facing the most extreme impacts from global warming and climate change, their physical consumption of resources is not the driving factor. And so there's a real mismatch between the drivers of climate change and those in the world who will face the greatest impacts. And the new special report makes that quite clear by um, showing that the greatest impacts are going to be in the tropical latitudes, Arctic's as well, but when we're talking about the number of people who live in given areas, the tropics are really facing a disproportionate um, impact from climate change compared to other parts of the world in sort of some of the mid-latitude regions. So we just wanted to give three examples of recent impacts of climate change that are happening in Africa. The first was um, tropical cyclone Ide. It was essentially the um, Hurricane Dorian of East Africa. It happened in March of 2019. Over 1,300 people were killed in Mozambique and several of the other countries around there, although Mozambique was hit the hardest. Currently, they estimate over $2 billion worth of damage. Um, and those type of events are made worse, as we know, by climate change. 
but they destroy the, the resilience of communities there. We've talked a lot about ecological resilience, but community resilience is extremely important. And I think the, the, the good news is that that's something that we have a much greater ability to impact. Um, the second example is what's happening in Lake Chad in Central Africa between Chad and Nigeria. That lake has lost 90% of its water volume over the past 15 years. Now that's not solely due to climate change and warming, it's also due to irrigation and other factors, but that illustrates the complexity of the problems we're facing. The way that we deal with land creates positive feedbacks that make the impacts of climate warming even worse. And in the area of Lake Chad in particular, the changes that are being seen in fishing communities and um, different agricultural communities that rely on rain-fed water and the lake for ir irrigation um, have created such um, levels of, of poverty, food insecurity, and livelihood insecurity that this area is now becoming um, a bit of a recruitment or breeding ground for violent extremism. Again, there's not one direct line between climate change and violent extremism or even between poverty and violent extremism. I wish it were that simple. But these issues are, are innately connected to one another. And the third example I'll mention is the ongoing drought in the Horn of Africa, which is a terrestrial impact. But given the monsoon seasons, given the amount of of ocean upwelling that happens around the Horn of Africa, in Somalia in particular, the drought that has been happening there for the past several years that has resulted in the displacement of millions of people internally um, and has recently put millions of children at risk from um, drought impacts is made worse by climate warming. So this is what um, Africa and the Indian Ocean are facing right now as a consequence of carbon emissions. So part B of the special report um, looked specifically at the projected risks for people and ecosystems. And one thing that is in incredibly valuable that the IPCC report does is puts levels of confidence around things. And I wish that those of us who look at the human impacts could be as confident in what we think the impacts will be as um, the people who study the physics and the biology. Um, unfortunately, it's just not a simple math equation. And so there's a lot lower levels of confidence around what we expect those impacts to be on on communities. But that's where the opportunity exists, and that's because we have the ability to impact through governance, through policy changes, the way that human beings, through their own free will, make um, changes in relation to their own behavior. Um, that being said, I want to put a pin in that and say it, it cannot be, it must be incumbent on those of us in developed countries who are creating the most amount of carbon emissions to not require or, or rely on developing countries to be the ones who fix our problems. We need to enable them and provide capacity and technical expertise, but it cannot be on developing countries in Africa throughout the tropical Indo-Pacific to fix the problems that we've created. So I think there are three primary mechanisms that I see in Africa and the Indian Ocean that are linking climate change to conflict and greater security issues in the maritime realm. The first is direct competition for finite and mobile resources. And several speakers have already touched very nicely with very good examples of the movement of fish, the changes in EEZs. There was a great question from the audience about um, EEZ boundaries. Those boundaries will change slightly, but with sea level rise. But in Africa alone, there are 12 different maritime disputes over um, economic, exclusive economic zone boundaries, which extend from the shoreline out to 200 nautical miles. In Southeast Asia, they overlap quite a lot. In Africa, in West Africa, there's a lot of overlap as well and a lot of contention. But these EEZ boundaries are the definition of where governance over the marine resources for a given country belongs to the domain of that given country. Now that country can choose to sell off access to oil exploration, mineral exploration, fisheries exploitation. And governments, especially in Africa, earn a lot of revenue by selling some of those rights. But those, the access to those resources is going to change under scenarios of climate warming. My colleagues um, at One Earth Future have done research on what causes conflict, oftentimes violent conflict over fish, and it's direct access to the resource coupled with and made worse by declining fish populations and unclear maritime boundaries. Not just maritime, but also the boundaries that exist in inland oceans, or in inland waters. So the second primary ne mechanism linking climate change to conflict is changes in food and livelihood security. And, and several of our speakers have talked about that, but I wanna dig in a little bit more on what we mean by food security in relation to marine resources. Food security is defined as the predictable and reliable access to affordable and nutritional forms of food. So three key words there, predictable, so that people can plan their lives and livelihoods, 
um, affordable and nutritious. And seafood is some of the most nutritious food that we have, low in fats, high in omega-3s, and really importantly, high in micronutrients that are important for childhood development and brain development. And so when you're talking about nutrition at a child's level, you're talking about setting the stage for generations of people to come. And access to seafood, and I would agree with John that there are ways that we can increase seafood consumption without destroying the, the marine ecosystems that we have, and it has to do with choosing what types of fish we eat and reducing some of the global trade we have around it. Um, that level of food security is extremely important to over two billion people in this world. A billion people in the world rely on seafood as their number one form of protein. And most of those people live in um, develop, developing economies and rely on subsistence and small-scale small fishing. I mean, one or two people out in a canoe collecting fish, not trawlers that have 40 to 50 people on, on board who can collect a lot of fish. So the third and final mechanism connecting climate change to conflict is through the widening gap of socioeconomic inequality across the world. Some people call this the north-south gap. These gaps are replicated at the local level in communities that rely on marine resources, at the state and federal level when you have um, concentration of wealth in different communities, oftentimes away from coastal communities, and at the global level in the accumulation of wealth in um, northern and developed countries. And so as climate change affects food and livelihood security, you're going to see a widening gap. And all of a sudden, the governance and the security implications for what were driven by resource questions do not become solutions that are resource-based any longer. Um, it's really a social justice issue, I think. Um, so I liked um, what you said about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I also didn't want to, to end on a bad note. So I do see some good things happening with maritime domain awareness and um, maritime governance, and that is the recognition by the world, really, um, about the import importance of um, regulating better distant water fishing nations and keeping track of fishing that are being done by large-scale industrial fleets in the waters of countries that rely on fisheries for food security and small scale subsistence um, consumption. So for example, the Port State Measures Agreement, which was led by the UN FAO, has now been ratified by enough countries to be put in place. And if you look at African and Southeast Asian countries, and those in um, South Asia as well, you have a very high rate of ratification by those countries because they know that having control over their ports and understanding the transparency behind fishing mo fisheries moving around the global economy is so important to what they're doing. So I would say, the Port State Measures Agreement right now needs, a few, needs some more adopters to really um, have a global impact, but that's one thing that I think we can have some hope about. Um, the bad is really the lack of data that we have on small-scale fisheries around the world. So um, earlier we saw some fantastic data from the Gulf of Maine, and we just don't have those kind of data sets for most of the world's fisheries. We don't know wh where the fish are, how big they are, how they're reproducing, and how much are being caught. And so in terms of capacity building, simply um, providing avenues and funding for data collection at a species level for fish is so very important um, for developing countries. Um, just to be able to track what's happening because we don't know what we have, we can't manage what we don't know. Um, and the third thing I'll say is the ugly, and that is um, the, the global subsidies for fisheries and fisheries fuel. And in fact, um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rashid Sumela, is speaking today or tomorrow with the World Trade Organization trying to lobby for reduction in fuel subsidies for global fishing fleets. Um, and the reason that most of us can afford to eat the food that we find in seafood restaurants here in the United States is because of government subsidizing the cost of catching those fish in the first place. And so that, I think, is something we absolutely need to address. And to end on a positive note, what I see changing in, um, in Africa and throughout the Pacific Ocean is the um, awareness of the youth on climate change and climate impacts. It's not, you know, it's not just um, Scandinavian youth. They're doing a fantastic job, but across Africa, you see a large awareness of the problem by, by youth and a, and a focus on local solutions that involve communities and indigenous knowledge, which is something that the report really focused on. Um, and also the empowerment of women and the inclusion of women in fisheries and maritime security issues as a means of changing the conversation and some of the paradigms around um, economic exploitation of marine resources. All right. Excellent. Thanks so much. So that's a great segue, I think, to Amy, who is going to talk a little bit about the adaptation burden and how that looks from a developing state's perspective. So I'm really happy to be here today, partly because I feel like historically, 
rather oddly, the human rights and environmental communities have operated somewhat separately, even though we really have a lot to offer to each other. And I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of, I think the science provides the what, the human rights provides the how. So I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean. Um, and first I'll talk about, very briefly, what are the human rights impacts of climate change? I think people have actually covered it pretty well without using the word human rights. But then also, how, what can human rights tell us about mitigation and adaptation? So just on the impacts on human rights, I mean, right to food, right to livelihoods, impacts on fisheries, these are huge. There are these also arable land, these are gonna be drivers of conflict. Conflict itself breeds more human rights problems. So all of this is, I have to say, pretty grim from a human rights perspective. Um, relocation, migration also raise enormous human rights concerns. I think this goes, this is intuitive. Um, the rights of indigenous peoples are also a particular concern because they're gonna be some of the first impacted groups and they tend to be some of the most vulnerable, partly because they really have no political representation. Usually in their own countries, they're such a small segment of the population. But I'm not gonna focus on the problems because we all know what, I think we all know what they are, basically. Um, I really wanna talk about what human rights might contribute to solutions. And this will pick up on some of what other people have said using different language. So one piece is that if we want governments to feel urgent about, adapt, uh, about addressing climate change, we really need to double down on democracy, rule of law, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, so that populations that are affected can actually pressure their governments. So in a way, to me, this calls for doubling down on what, let's say, the US government already does a lot of, supporting better governance around the world. So that's pretty easy. We sort of know how to do that, even if it's not perfect. I also think, I want, I want to pick up on something I think I heard in the last panel, which is that Sometimes communities themselves can help us solve problems. So for example, if we really respected the land rights, the traditional land rights of people in the Congo Basin or in Malaysian Indonesia or other areas, we'd be protecting peatlands, right? Indigenous peoples and traditional people with traditional livelihoods have lived in, they've lived in their environments without destroying them for a long time and they know how to do that. So it's one of these areas where there's a real marriage between protecting really important carbon sinks and protecting people's rights. And then what can we learn about adaptation? So what I, my particular expertise is in the nexus of business and human rights. And we've learned a lot over the past few decades about what happens when you try to engineer big national projects from the top. It doesn't go very well. So there's been a lot of time and energy spent on, for example, in the context of, let's say, mining. How do you actually carry out a project like that with genuine input from communities that are affected? And, and, and why, why would you want that? Well, first, I think Heather sort of alluded to this indirectly. Groups like ind indigenous peoples will actually, first of all, understand the impacts better, and they may have ideas on how to mitigate them that wouldn't occur to us. And that's not just true for indigenous peoples, that's true for communities around the world. But the other reason is that I think it also will, an experience suggests that it will help get community buy-in. So if you're asking people to change how they make their living, change the way they fish or otherwise earn, earn their daily bread, you've got to have them believe in what, what you're asking them to do and they have to be part of coming up with that solution or they won't do it. And in the worst case scenario, it'll actually lead to conflict. So we know how to do this. We have a lot of experience. And I guess my call would be when we're coming up with international frameworks or national frameworks, making sure that that approach is embedded. I see bits and pieces of that. Some of the major climate change adaptation funds at least have environmental and social policies. I'm not sure how well that's implemented. This isn't easy stuff, but this has to be part of it. We, we won't get where we need to be if we don't have community buy-in and intelligence incorporated into our approaches to climate change. And so that's a challenge. We have to think big. It's a big problem, these big solutions, and we have to think locally, and we have to do both. Thanks. Excellent, thank you guys, appreciate it. So um, that was uh, a really great, I think, translation of some of the impacts we heard from in the first panel into how it looks like in the real world. Um, and I want to take uh, a minute to just think about this idea that we picked up in the first panel of a dynamic world and how we adapt to it. Take a little bit of what I think Sarah and Amy were touching on there at the end.
And, and I'm just going to throw out a quick general question to, to the panel, and, um, and all of you can weigh in as you see fit. But um, how are our multilateral institutions uh, grappling with this challenge, and are they up to the task? But you can take it in, in if you want, uh, regionally. Speak about the Arctic Council, for example, Southeast Asia, um, uh, East Africa. Are, are they um, beginning to deal with this challenge? Um, are they ready for the challenge? What kinds of steps do we need to, to take to improve upon them? I think maybe we heard a little bit of that from Amy just now, but, but I'll leave it to you guys to dive in. Maybe you have well, to I'll just start again, just sort of pull on the comments of the uh, Arctic Council. My own view is the Arctic Council is straining enormously. Uh, in many ways, uh, the international community is putting a lot of burden on a, a structure that wasn't designed to carry all of that burden. Uh, the Arctic Council is, uh, again, it's an intergovernmental forum. It deals on consensus. It produces some remarkable uh, Arctic clim climate impact assessments and maritime shipping assessments that are extraordinary. I don't think they get much play uh, of them, but they're an incredible value. Um, the, the six working groups that work on a wide variety of issues, they, they do important work, uh, but it's very isolated. Uh, it's not well known. But there's a lot of things now that are happening in the Arctic that the Arctic Council isn't designed to, to do. Um, and so, again, what's happening is things are being built around the Arctic Council. So the, the innovations that I mentioned to you, the search and rescue agreement, the oil spill response, there's an international science agreement. It uses the framework of the Arctic Council, so the eight uh, members, but then the Arctic Council itself has nothing to do with the implementation of those agreements. Um, uh, the Arctic Council members can, uh, of course, they just uh, didn't, they failed to uh, approve a declaration after the uh, Arctic Council Ministerial in May. But uh, all the members can say, yes, this is a great impact, but I'm not going to do anything nationally uh, to reduce the climate impact. So the Russian government isn't reducing gas flaring in the Arctic. Uh, so it, it's nice, it's lovely, but it's not moving the needle. And so what I see, how structures that are being created, the Arctic Economic Council, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, they're all outside the Arctic Council. So um, You talked about local solutions, and <clears throat> that uh, caught my ear uh, when uh, the lands report, special report on, on lands came out in August. There was a great panel. Um, Bob Watson joined us for that. Uh, we also had the director of the Global Environment Facility uh, on the panel, and she spoke about just that. And the idea that oftentimes you know, we talk about these global commitments, whether it's Paris or, or other agreements, um, we've set these national goals, but those goals are often being implemented at regional, subnational scales, regional, local scales, and really when you're talking about the developing world, you're talking about community level action. So can you talk maybe a little bit about some pathways for, for success in, in that kind of work? Sure, sure. Again, I think this isn't a problem that's new. So that's, that's the good news is we've had challenges in implementing large scale projects at the national and local level for a long time. And so we've learned something. Um, I think you can look at standards like the IFC performance standards, their environmental and social performance standards. They're not perfect, they're pretty good. Now implementing it is a different question. Doing that effectively is challenging, but it's, you know, it covers both just having an environmental and social management system in the first place. So it's a requirement of entities that the IFC lends to but then also has specific chapters on land rights and resettlement and indigenous peoples, labor rights, um, and other aspects of environmental impact. And, and what I've seen so far, and, and sorry, just to add to that, the IFC also has governance around that, right? They have experts in-house to help their clients actually do these things properly if they don't know how. Um, they have a grievance mechanism that's independent and raises problems when these aren't People, normal people can bring complaints to complain when they're, they're, the, the standards aren't followed. Um, what I'm seeing in some of the adaptation funds is they're picking up some of this, but with a very light touch. And so my guess is amongst other things, like that could be strengthened. And then that can be, you know, if a government wants to access that funding, then they have to start developing this capacity. And we probably also need to be financially supporting that capacity. This isn't easy. It's a different, for a lot of countries that have very top-down cultures, it's a different way of doing things. Um, so I think that's something that should be just incorporated, particularly as we think about adaptation just across the board. And again, 
there are there, there's stuff you can almost pick up off the shelf in terms of what the standards should be and even some of the governance. Um, I also just want to talk on one other area that like there's been some progress on um, on having frameworks, uh, but probably needs more, and that's migration. So people that are migrating because of either su sudden onset or slow onset climate change aren't considered refugees under international law. Um, and so our migration frameworks are slowly evolving. There's a global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration that was finalized in 2018. It does talk about climate change, maybe not as much as it should. It doesn't solve the problem, but there is some progress in that area. Um, and I think that's going to be a key issue to get our brains and our political willpower around going forward. Something that uh, Pacific Island states in particular are going to be concerned about in the coming yes. decades. So thank you very much. Um, audience, if you have some questions. Uh, do we have uh, microphones? So yeah, let's do like we did in the first panel, and we'll take up to three at, at one time. So we've got one here. Do we have a second? And one in the back there. Uh, OK, so let's go with those two. Thank you very much, Michael Zwern. Um, my questions are more for John and Sarah, and I really appreciated the discussion on the impacts at the community levels in Indonesia and Asia broadly and in Africa, like Chad, Mozambique, Somalia. I'm very interested in to know what is being done at the community levels within the most affected communities to address and anticipate the impacts of climate-driven risk and to mitigate the chances for driver of conflict. And I'm partly leading this question for Sarah because I'm aware of your work in Somalia, but uh, at the community level where people could be drawn into criminality, violence, extremism, and conflict, what could be done with those communities that are most at risk and on the front lines? Thank you. Well, I, uh, oh, so let's take a second. Oh, sorry, we'll, sorry. We'll, just, we'll, we'll patch them together a little bit. Hi, I'm Monica Medina. I, think I know a lot of you. Um, my question is uh, about technology and the use of um, electronic monitoring and electronic reporting systems and whether you're seeing an uptake in that anywhere else. Um, Monica, I'm sorry, can you hold your oh, mic? Oh, sorry, you. can you hear me now? Yeah, that's So great. the question is about electronic monitoring and electronic reporting as a way to better manage fisheries in the face of climate change. Wondering if you're seeing an uptake in that anywhere else. I know there are some efforts here in the U.S., but they're sort of in fits and starts. I think that this the case globally as well, but I'd be interested in knowing if any of you are aware of any um, places where it's really going well. Do you have a third? Uh, let's get one here in the middle. Thank, thank you very Thank you very much. Um, wonderful presentation. I was wondering if you could speak to the role of the international financial institutions, for example, World Bank or Asian Development Bank, with respect to capacity building in places such as Africa or Asia. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So we've got uh, one on community level risk mitigation, and maybe that ties in a little bit to some of that international funding, funding work. Um, and then we've got another question on um, uptake of electronic monitoring and sort of advanced approaches to fishery management as a, as a way for climate management. So I'll just throw it to you guys and who wants to dive in. Sure. Well, um, thank you, Michael, for your question. I think um, to answer the question of what is happening at the community level, I think it, that question is difficult to answer briefly, and it has to do with what the impacts of the community are and the capacity and knowledge of the community. Um, in the Horn of Africa in particular, the largest impacts of climate change are actually terrestrial agriculture impacts and drought. And so most of the capacity building and community, I wouldn't even say there's community risk mitigation that's going on right now. There's just simply survival that's happening. Um, I'd say that in the maritime realm though, probably the greatest amount of capacity development is happening in data collection and um, very basic approaches, data poor approaches to stock assessment that happens through regional cooperation with some of these larger scale levels. So I don't, um, in a lot of communities that have already been impacted by climate change or that are regularly struggling with issues of food and income insecurity that may be completely decoupled from climate change, um, I'm not sure that risk mitigation is something that is even where we are right now. I think, I think it's more thinking about um, ways to improve resource management that incorporates climate change at, at some level, at, at some regional level. Um, it's not a great answer to your question, but there, you know, to, to, to work at the community level, I think you really need to have 
support from the federal and state governments when, when relevant um, to enable communities to both bring problems to the federal and, and national levels um, for solutions. And so I'm seeing a lot of that sort of level of community education and environmental education around the impacts of climate change. Plus you're seeing a lot of community level mobilization as a result of some of the awareness um, building that's happening right now. Oh, but I did want to mention, I did want to actually address your point about relations to um, violent extremism or recruitment into criminal activity. And while that can happen, and we do see some of those things happening, I also think that the issue is so much more complex than just climate change causing um, food and livelihood insecurity, causing recruitment into violent extremist groups. It's, it's not that simple. It's a much more complex issue. And in fact, in the, issue, in the area of the Horn of Africa, there have been a lot of linkages between um, the rise of piracy about 50 15 years ago and changes in their marine fisheries. But in a lot of times, these things are really not, the, the story that gets told in the media is not nearly as, um, as simple as, as one that we would like. And the downside to that is that simply solving some of these problems will not address some of the issues around the globe with violent extremism. Uh, just a quick answer uh, to, to compliment. Um, uh, so I think there are three, three things that are, that are happening. There's a lot more to be done, but one, one is science, more scientific information about what's happening in the water to help these communities understand uh, how to deal with things. Second is, is planning, uh, and this is where there needs to be a lot of improvement, planning for the future. What are, what are these uh, resources going to look like in the future and how, how can communities plan for that? And then finally, uh, to Amy's point, is governance and self-empowerment. Uh, so as an example, some of the work that we did in, in this blue swimming crab fishery uh, bringing, you know, the, the local governments had never really reached out to the stakeholders before in these communities and organized them. And so we, we helped them do that. And one of the things they did with that was uh, the government announced that it was opening, this is the Lampung prov uh, prov uh, provincial government, they announced that they were opening a sand mine to send sand to Jakarta. Uh, but the fishermen there thought, said, no, that mine's right in the middle of our, of our crab fishing grounds. And they, the government heard from these fishermen that they had never heard from before. And so uh, building governance like that really is, uh, I think, a critical way to give people not just buy-in, but an outlet to shape their own futures. Uh, real quick on the technology. Um, so obviously, I think you mentioned in the US, there's a lot of emphasis on, um, on improving monitoring, which is important not just uh, for the science, to understand what's happening in the water, to be able to set uh, to, uh, to base management decisions on, but also uh, to improve accountability. Uh, because every fisherman will tell you they don't want to catch the last fish, but they can't sit around and let you catch the last fish. So there's a lot of, uh, there's, uh, as, a, as a commons uh, issue, there's a lot of importance placed on knowing that everybody else, the community as a whole, is really uh, abiding by the same rules. So the U.S. is, put, is testing a lot of those uh, new technologies. Uh, Japan, as part of its reform, is now pushing to uh, modernize its data system. If you go and look at the records there, you blow the dust off. The records, uh, you know, from, from three years earlier of, the, of where the fish are and how much there is, and you just can't manage uh, stocks that are shifting rapidly uh, in these days. Uh, China has also realized that accountability and enforcement is a big weakness in its management system, and they're taking steps to do that too. And I'm sure some of you have heard about the efforts of Global Fishing Watch that uses satellite data to track fishing vessels around the world. Indonesia signed up, uh, and I think there are a number of other countries that have signed up to partner with this, uh, uh, with this NGO that's helping to sort of make transparent some of the things that are happening on the water. Well, I'll just say something very quickly on technology in the Arctic. It's going to be transformative because you have vast distances with very limited infrastructure. So helping to understand both the environmental impact on the terrestrial environment, but also to continue to monitor maritime. We're also, again, how we connect communities. The Arctic Council has been working uh, for the last several years on enhancing broadband communications with, with the most remote indigenous communities. This is telemedicine, this is uh, you know, online education, and this is awareness of bringing what their, their observations and helping us understand that. And just on the tracking as well, even in the Arctic, that's why this, is, this polar mandatory uh, code is so important because it now has to track, uh, uh, vessels have to have AIS. Hopefully there's mechanisms that we can understand because we are seeing uh, certainly anecdotal uh, instances of fishing stocks moving north for cooler waters as the polar ice recedes and the water is warm, the, uh, the, the plankton changes, and we're going to see fishing vessels increasingly in uh, higher and higher uh, latitudes, making sure we understand uh, both with the fishing vessels as well as the scientific vessels. Not all is science, my friends, and we have to understand 
who and what are operating in the Arctic. Technology is going to have to be transformative to how we monitor the Arctic in the future. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we have to stop there so we can get to our final conversation. But I want to once again thank this panel. It was a really excellent conversation. I really very much appreciate it. Okay, folks, we were running a little over, and uh, so I apologize for that. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is John Hamry, uh, president here at CSIS, and delighted that all of you are here. Um, let me just say a word about this uh, SOS project. This, this came out of conversations with Phil Stevenson uh, one night, and we were talking about how the high seas are lawless. And it shows up in the exploitation of fishing stocks. It shows up in uh, transportation of illegal goods. It shows up in, in uh, piracy. It shows up in uh, the logistics movement of really bad people. OK, this is all part of this landscape. Um, and so we wanted to do something that brought the security community together with the environmental community to say, we have a shared interest in solving this problem. And I'm so very grateful today that uh, John Richardson has chosen to be with us uh, as, a, as kind of a concluding keynote speaker. Uh, John is, uh, of course, just stepped down from having been the chief of naval operations. He worked in every bit of this, every part of his professional career. Uh, and certainly the last four years when he was a CNO was he f focusing on this very question. And it's a unique opportunity for us. So would you, with your warm applause, welcome to the stage John Richardson, former Chief of Naval Operations. With. Yeah, Thanks for inviting really, me. Really appreciate it. And, it's and great I, to be back here at CSAS, by the way. So. Excellent. I, I know you're familiar with our, with our humble abode here. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, this is a really just wonderful way to cap off what's been a real stimulating couple of uh, panels this morning. Um, I think for me, what has really kind of hit home is this idea of uh, a more competitive world and a more dynamic world and one that needs to be more adaptive in, in lots and lots of different ways. Uh, we talked about, obviously in the first panel, some really grim impacts uh, from, from climate. Uh, we talked in the second panel about how these changes are going to translate uh, in specific places around the globe to uh, instability. Um, opening Arctic, food stress in the tropics, um, lots of opportunities for, for challenge. Um, we talk about how these challenges translate into threats, but threats, of course, can take a lot of different forms. They can be acute, they can be strategic, and so I guess I wanted to open with by just getting your thoughts on uh, what kinds of climate-related threats uh, most concern you, the acute or the strategic? Uh, I guess if you ask me today, it's the acute threats, and if you ask me tomorrow, it's the strategic threats. So, uh, and I think that, that uh, they, they have a sometimes constructive way of interfering with each other and sometimes not so helpful, where the acute can, can really uh, occupy all of your time and resources, all of your attention, and uh, sort of cause you to maybe neglect some of the longer term strategic things. And I think that uh, with respect to the ocean and climate change, it's maybe particularly vulnerable to that type of a dynamic because those acute challenges that are here and now, right in front of us, you know, the 10 meter targets, if you will, uh, are, are very vivid. And some of these other things, they're just now becoming, you know, well known, well agreed upon uh, to, to the vast majority of people. The ocean is out of sight, out of mind. 
you know, and, and, and so even in, uh, here in the United States, other nations that we talk about who have been maritime nations, if you will, since their, their birth, uh, there's kind of this sea blindness that arises of uh, we just don't realize maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, an acute basis, how much we depend on the seas and on the oceans for our prosperity, our livelihood, our security. And so, and then on top of that, you know, this climate change dynamic is not, it's becoming more vi visible, I suppose, but, you know, it's not as visible as some of those things that are capturing the headlines every day. And so we've really got to almost force ourselves, discipline ourselves to spend the appropriate time and attention on this, uh, particularly now, I think, because uh, there's a really growing sense of uh, urgency and the fact that uh, some of these dynamics that are, that are happening, you know, they may be irreversible if we don't act pretty soon. Um, picking up on the idea of driving us ourselves to take action, um, looking back across the various uh, strategic security documents over the last decade or so, you can go back to 2010 and, and in the Quadrennial Defense Review, uh, climate took up a whole chapter uh, uh, within that review. Uh, in 2014, uh, it was sprinkled throughout, though perhaps uh, with a less dedicated focus. And of course, today it's, it's absent um, uh, for political reasons uh, from uh, the national security strategy. Um, but I guess my question to you is a little bit of, with this view of driving us to action, how important from a security standpoint, from a, from a maybe from the mind of the Pentagon, uh, are these documents in terms of driving action, in terms of, of allowing the U.S. security community to um, adapt better to yeah. the threats that are going to be facing? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a believer in the importance of strategy. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, and you know, kind of getting back to our first question, what a, a well-crafted strategy and a well-communicated strategy allows us to do is to uh, make sure that you know, while some part of the organization may be captivated by the here and now, uh, there's another part of the organization that can get after these longer-term things. And so I think it really is important that uh, our strateg strategic documents mention these sorts of challenges, maybe even threats. Uh, yeah, having said that, I don't know that sort of, if you think about the elements of national power, right, the, I'm not sure that the military dimension of national power is really the primary focal point to address uh, the challenges of climate change. And uh, certainly will have a, a, an impact, an implication for the security environment. Um, but if we look at this primarily through a military, you know, def military dimension lens, I think we could really distort the solution and, and, and arrive at, at approaches that are self-limiting, maybe. And so, you know, when you're talking about, you know, just from the earlier panels, when you're talking about challenges that are much more fundamental, uh, you know, food security, right? I mean, that's, that's a much broader challenge than, a, a, you know, the military can solve. It, this, this takes a, a really a, na a whole national approach, if not an international approach, and uh, the, the comments about are our institutions tuned to, to arise to this challenge, I think, are really fundamental types of questions. And you know, from a security standpoint, you know, again, I spent a lot of my time trying to uh, highlight the importance of the oceans and also, and, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here, that uh, the oceans are they're, they're under a lot of stress, you know, just separate from the, the climate change stress. You know, the, the shipping in the ocean has increased by 400% in the last 25 years, which is an astounding increase. Uh, in the, uh, the seabed infrastructure, you know, whether we're getting at natural, re uh, natural resources or whether we are talking about uh, intercontinental communications, you know, 99% of the internet rides on those cables. So the seabed is becoming, you know, almost a domain unto itself. Mega cities are, are moving. You know, they're growing in number and, they're, and most of them are coming up on the shoreline. So, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of stress already on our oceans and now you overlay that uh, with this, uh, this, this stress and challenge of climate change. Um, it really sort of begs for a supra uh, type of a, a, an approach that would incorporate certainly the military dimension of national power, but has must uh, be broader than that. Mm -hmm. Sticking with the idea of institutions, we talked about um, this way that our 
the dynamic nature of the world is, is, is stressing what is a world that's built on static norms, static institutions. Um, so we're kind of creating gaps, if you will, cracks in that, in that established mode of governance for the world. Yeah. And lots of mischief can happen in those cracks. Yeah. It seems like this is the kind of dyna dynamism in the world today that can provide extra opportunities for hybrid conflict, for gray zone conflict. Yeah. Um, are there particular places in the world, regions in the world, that you worry about that kind of stress the most? Well, uh, I, I think that the earlier panels touched a lot on some of the regional dynamics that are at play here. And then in each of those regions, you know, and we do a lot of uh, talk amongst chiefs of Navy about this and, and chiefs of Coast Guard. And it really, uh, just the earlier panels highlighted, it's you know, where you sit is where you stand. And uh, you know, in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, boy, they're, as somebody said, they're, they're kind of focused on the survival, right? The, the basics of maritime domain awareness, just being able to you know, somewhat govern you know, that space in, in, in the slightest manner. Um, you know, in, in more developed countries, of course, they've got you know, pretty secure uh, means of governing their territorial waters and even their exclusive economic zones. Uh, you know, that's not the case everywhere. And so, um, you know, these institutions have got to, you know, one size necessarily won't fit all. Uh, it, it does give rise to these, these seams. And I think a lot of our institutions, you know, particularly the ones I was wrestling with in the Navy, they are, well, they're highly structured. Uh, they're, they're, they're fundamentally uh, built to handle kind of linear problems, you know, phase zero, phase one, phase two. And I think that, uh, they, they, they operate inside of regional boundaries, kind of artificially imposed regional boundaries. And this, this climate change uh, challenge is, is really going to impose a, a great stress on, on those institutions. It's highly nonlinear, happening simultaneously. It is truly global. And, uh, and you know, the, we, we talked about the importance of the science. I think it's also, you know, history would, would, I think, tell us we've, we've got to approach this with a deep sense of humility in terms of just how much we can understand and absorb and, and you know, measure a thousand times before we cut once on this uh, thing. Because so, we could end up doing more harm than, than good if we don't uh, do it right. Um, when, uh, when we launched this program in January, uh, Senator Whitehouse was kind enough to join us for a conversation, and, and he had some remarks that I often return to around this idea of uh, a conflict uh, of, I'm sorry, confluence of resentments and how uh, we are running the risk right now of engendering a confluence of resentments around the world um, through our actions or lack of actions on climate, but that there are similarly opportunities to mitigate those, those yeah. confluence uh, of resentments. And that there is an idea that uh, American leadership um, is, as in most things, indispensable in this area. Um, Beyond just mitigation now, I'm thinking about adaptation and I'm thinking about alliances and partnerships. And uh, I guess I would just ask you, what do you think about the opportunity for American leadership uh, in working with our partners and allies to, to be more adaptive in the security space uh, in the yeah. face of climate? Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, it, it, if we're gonna have a seat at the table, if this uh, future is going to sort of come out the way that uh, we would like it for you know, the health and prosperity of our nation, for our our future generations, and America is, uh, I would argue, still optimally poised to lead. And we, we do have a tremendous network of allies and partners. That's under stress as well. But I think, uh, you know, it, particularly in the maritime uh, dimension, uh, things tend to go pretty well. You know, and this is one area I think where the military dimension can play a stabilizing role, and uh, and a little bit biased. I think that of uh, because we share a lot of cultures and norms, you know, just that are that transcend national boundaries, right? And uh, I, I would argue that first among equals are you know navy to navy types of things. So we can go out into international waters. We have to we have to operate in meaningful ways. Communicate. You have to put together plans and operate and be safe and 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 uh, and be productive. And so uh, you know, not to just take this analogy to the breaking point, but you know, Navy to Navy, Coast Guard to Coast Guard, maritime types of partnerships can kind of be the stabilizing keel 
as we move forward into the future for this ship of state that will allow some of the other winds, you know, diplomatic, economic winds to blow. We want to come out sort of relatively close, you know, to on track when these, when this, when these winds abate and uh, you know, keeping that uh, alliance and partnership structure together, I think is really uh, perhaps one of the most critical roles that militaries can play uh, to get us through this. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think I'm happy to turn to the audience now and, and take some questions. We have, have some folks. Let's go one, two, and do we have a third? Uh, third, okay, front. I'm uh, John Wortman with Esri, the uh, GIS software company. I I'm curious, Admiral, you were serving as CNO when both the Paris Climate Accords were signed by President Obama in 2016, and then when President Trump withdrew the United States from that agreement. How did you and or General Dunford view the, the role of military best advice in terms of the security parameters of either being in that document or removing us from that document? Okay. Well, we'll go. We'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. You, you, you. Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead. I was. Okay. I was yeah. No, you. No, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just speak for myself, and it really kind of went back to what I said at the uh, at the last, uh, you know, at sort of the end of uh, Witt's question was, uh, I, I saw my role as primarily being to reach out in the maritime dimension of power, bringing those chiefs of navy together and just sort of saying, hey, look, you know, these alliances, these partnerships that we have, despite what may be happening uh, and despite how you interpret that, you know, let's make sure that we keep, we keep exercising together. We keep up with personal exchanges. We keep inviting each other to other schools. You know, all of those things that create sort of a, uh, a deep and meaningful relationship that uh, is founded on sort of the common principles that uh, and, and common ground that our two nations can, can find. You know, that, that was sort of the primary emphasis that I took anyway to uh, make sure that you know, we did as much good to, to keep the partnership strong as possible. Hello, Admiral Richardson. Uh, Eugene Babau from the Stevenson Foundation. Quick question for you, sir. Um, is there a way to introduce IUU fishing as a mission for the Navy um, and have it actually included into the NDAA as Maritime Safe has yeah. been trying to do? Uh, and can that then be used as a gateway to cooperation with other navies mm -hmm. that you mentioned? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a, this IUU fishing uh, topic comes up at, at a lot of these regional maritime conferences. That, uh, that I had the uh, privilege of attending. Uh, because as the earlier panel said, it's so fundamentally you know, important to the prosperity of so much of the world. Uh, having said that, uh, and, and you know, to your point, it, uh, to my mind, it's really about authorities, right? What, what are the uh, span of authorities that are given to navies? And, and that's widely varying, right? In, in our nation, the law enforcement and the sorts of fishery enforcement authorities fall primarily with the Coast Guard, and so that, that's a separate service, and we partner very closely together, particularly in information sharing and uh, maritime domain awareness. Uh, in other nations, you know, those authorities are all united in one maritime body. And so, uh, again, you know, where are those, uh, I would go to the authorities, right? Uh, those those nations that, or those uh, institutions that have the proper authorities to do that type of fishery enforcement are uh, the ones that should be doing it, and that varies from state to state. Where the Navy can play a role, I think, is in sharing information, right? And so we're out there on the high seas. We've got overhead, you know, types of uh, capabilities. We've we don't have you know perfect granular awareness, but we've got pretty good awareness, and we can focus it where it needs to be. And so I think that. Uh, by taking a look at the uh, information exchange agreements, we can do a lot of good to enable those institutions with the proper authorities to respond to potential violations. Uh, somebody mentioned also, yeah, this is also a rich area, I think, for uh, technology, the infusion of technology. So someone mentioned AIS, and I know that there are others. 
you know, okay, what are the rules and norms and how are they enforced in terms of what a, a particular ship is squawking on AIS and how are we going to respond to that if we find that what they're saying in their AIS transmission is different from what we observe them to be doing or maybe they turn it off altogether, et cetera. The, you know, the, the good guys are pretty much complying, but those, of course, aren't the folks that we're after. Uh, the other ones are, are harder to see maybe taking a little bit more exquisite type of technology to detect it, and then sharing that with the uh, law enforcement uh, authorities that can respond to it. There's one here. Oh. How's it going? Um, Alexander with Senator Murkowski's office. Um, we've seen recently this year that the Navy has kind of pushed back a little bit away from their climate research, climate studies. Um, recently, the task force on climate change was actually shut down this year. Uh, my question for you is, what is the Navy doing to compensate for that loss? What are your guys' research priorities that you've seen that this might be good for the next administration of the new CNO to really pursue? Um, and then kind of also the same realm is, what do you think is the, ne the near future for uh, the use of the Navy in the Arctic? Well, I think that uh, you would find, if you just look at the data, that the Navy's been more involved with the Arctic in the last two, three, four years than we have been for you know, really since the end of the Cold War, right? And just some examples that I like throwing around. We, spent, we sent a, a carrier strike group up in the uh, north of the uh, Arctic Circle in uh, November of 2018. And, uh, you know, we, I mean, it's tough operating up there, as you all know. And uh, we had to kind of crack open some old books who hadn't been up there since 1991 you know, with that type of a force element. And so uh, what we found is that uh, while much has changed in those uh, 20 or so years, it's still really cold as hell up there and the seas are very, very rough. And so it, uh, you know, we had to get our sea legs back in terms of uh, doing that. Bring baseball bats, right? That was one of the lessons because there's nothing like a, a Louisville slugger to smash the ice off of your superstructure and your radars and everything else. And so, uh, you know, some things remain fairly uh, primitive. Uh, we've done a number of uh, exercises in, the, uh, in Alaska, right? And so uh, this is you know, one of kind of one of our gems as a nation in the Arctic region. And uh, in fact, I think we just concluded one uh, up there that involved you know, a pretty sophisticated uh, operation with uh, Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, we've got, you know, despite the, uh, the, the recent trends and headlines that you know, the Navy has a steady uh, investment in uh, ocean uh, science. And in fact, when I was the chief of naval operations, we, just to reinvigorate uh, what I thought, what I saw as kind of a slipping uh, competitive edge in ocean research, we stood up Task Force Ocean, uh, which was a, uh, uh, an academic effort primarily, you know, focused at those really bright stars uh, in, the, in the academy that are doing ocean research, infusion of resources to make sure that you know, we stay on the front end of this, uh, not only you know, for our own sake, but you know, where there is a competitive dimension to understanding the ocean and, and ocean sciences that we stay competitive as well. Great, more questions? I've stunned him into silence. Yeah, no. one, one in the back there, Monica. <laughs> I'll ask again. Um, I love this topic. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, great discussion with um, question. Monica, I'm sorry. Kindle. Sorry, I'll get closer again. Um, thanks so much, Admiral, for being here. Great discussion with and thanks for letting me ask a second question. So my question for you, Admiral, is you called climate change a challenge, sort of repeatedly referred to it as a challenge. But is it more than that? I mean, when you look at um, U.S. military um, installations that have been severely impacted by it, um, and when you think about it as a, not only a threat multiplier, but the potential for its reach to our own um, communities and our shores, is that, you know, uh, is calling it a challenge not enough? Um, is it more like a, any other threat that is existential, as often people refer to it? Um, yeah. Just curious how you rank it. It's a bit of semantics, I suppose. and. Uh, I guess in my mind, uh, you know, a challenge or a threat, that, that's not meant to prioritize them in terms of their importance, okay? It's just sort of the nature of it. I, I would say that something is, a th that is threatening you 
has got a, you know, kind of a, a deliberate uh, approach towards, you know, harming you, right? Uh, one thing about the class, it's just going to happen, right? It's just, it has, in fact, that's one of the scariest things about it. It has no, uh, you know, aim. It's got no intellect. It's just the science is just going to take over here, right? And, uh, and uh, this is this sense of urgency, you know, some of these bigger forces in, in this scientific dynamic that, that really governs deep ocean currents and uh, coastal regions. I don't mean by calling it a challenge to lessen the impact of that, you know, and uh, particularly along our coasts. And, you know, it won't surprise you that the Navy is present mostly along our coast. So it's got a, a lot of impact on our bases, our infrastructure, all of those things. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's sort of one of, it's like in those really, the, the, the scariest horror movies are those things where this force is just moving without a conscience through and manifesting uh, its, its, itself on, on the environment. This is climate change, you know? It's almost spookier than a threat that has a deliberate uh, intellect that's after us. It's just, it's just happening to us, and, and uh, we're gonna have to, to just deal with it. We can't, we can't convince it not to threaten us, right? We, this is something that's a, a challenge that is uh, super urgent. Uh, and that's how I see it anyway. So I took very much to heart your, your point about, you know, this is not a necessarily a military threat and that in as much as it's not um, something that is uh, sparking an acute military conflict um, in the way that we think of these things happening traditionally, uh, it's hard to say Navy go deal with this challenge. Yeah, go, um, go wrestle climate change go, to the go, ground. Go, go, go nuke that hurricane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah well. but, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of opportunity for the services no, that's to right. engage and to work. And I, yeah. and I think, I want to go back to that, that point that we, we talked about a little bit earlier about this idea, this opportunity for American leadership, and your point about how um, uh, Navy to Navy, um, maritime to maritime conversations are sometimes most fruitful and yeah. most grounded and, and um, solid and honest conversations that we have with our international partners. Um, there's a report just out by the Climate and Security Group, which is the Association of Retired Security Officials, um, Climate Security Plan for America, as these things are called, and they call for the establishment of a national security directive addressing climate response, and they go into some detail about what that might look like, and the different services, the different agencies, thing, things of that nature. They particularly call out um, developing regional security plans with our partners and allies. Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of pose that to you about your thoughts on, on one, about how you might make something like that happen through the bureaucracy of the Pentagon and go back to that point about you know, strategic planning and what's useful, and maybe that gets a little bit to the lexicon issue. Mm -hmm. But then also about what that might look like and what might be useful. Again, because we're not looking necessarily to, to you know, deal with a particular issue, but allow ourselves to be more adaptive in the security environment and using that, that, that very adaptability as something that we can use to strengthen our, our alliances. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. So first, just in terms of, you know, what does this mean for the military? Uh, you know, we ignore this at our own peril, right? And uh, just as so many people talked about in the other panels, uh, where there are security challenges, security threats, those are real, real threats, uh, tensions. You know, now, you know, you know, again, I don't, I don't mean to be too cute, pun not intended, but you turn the temperature up on that, mm -hmm. you know, and climate change just makes it all harder, more right. pressure more stress, you know, and uh, so when you're talking about uh, defending and governing uh, international boundaries, even at sea, uh, the fact that, you know, your food source is now migrating outside of your international boundary, you know, that in and of itself raises a security challenge of the most fundamental nature uh, to a nation. And so I think that this idea of a national security directive, and if you look at the people that put that report together. Mm -hmm. Very broad, Absolutely. very distinguished. These are people, Absolutely. very thoughtful people, and uh, you know, from a wide variety of, uh, of national security, right? Not just military, but uh, so many other places. So I, w I think that uh, you know, this type of an approach is, is really valuable. And it would be not so much in the Department of Defense, I would uh, suggest would play a supporting role uh, but this must occur kind of at the National Security Council level to sort of unite all the elements of the government uh, and uh, 
and unite all the elements you know, of national power to, to get after this. Uh, there are some, some aspects of this that are going to be highly regional, and so these regional uh, you know, aspects of the, uh, of the directive, I think, are very useful. And then you know, perhaps the most challenging would be what are those truly global you know, dimensions, sort of trans-Pacific types of things that need, need to be addressed. Uh, and, and when you think about you know, the time frames to bring these sorts of structures together, right? It took about, I think, about a decade to get UNCLOS ratified, right? Uh, we talked about the, uh, the, some of the agreements in the Arctic, again, about a decade to get these things uh, brought together and agreed to and signed. Uh, I don't know that we have a decade, really, uh, of time left before some of these things become, you know, really, the, the momentum builds to the point that it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to turn them back. And so there's a, there's a sense of urgency that is going to have to come to this international dimension that uh, is, is going to have, it's going to be unprecedented in a way to, to get these agreements together in a time that's relevant. Okay. John White. Thank you very much. I'm John White, uh, the head of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Um, so roughly 15 years ago today, another retired CNO, Admiral Watkins, was testifying before Congress. And uh, he stated that ocean science, ocean research in this nation is it's spread across a confusing number of agencies at the federal, state, and local levels. And the public is, is crying out for data and information in a way that can help them make meaningful decisions. My question, as you look at your great experience of looking at this federal structure of ocean science and research with Task Force Ocean, as you did, how far have we come in that 15 years, and I guess how far do we have to go, especially when you add in the importance of climate change and the fact that the clock is running out here, as yeah. you mentioned in some of these areas, and yeah. it's a question. So. Well, I think we could always do better, John, you know, in terms of uh, sharing data. I mean, it, you won't be surprised, even just inside the Navy, some of our labs and, and the efforts inside uh, the uh, Navy you know, the, the collaboration there, we were always striving to improve that, right? Uh, so that we could really move forward in a meaningful way, eliminate duplication and all those sorts of things. And, and it's not any better, you know, as you expand that uh, aperture to include other agencies. Uh, you know, Task Force OSHA was an idea, uh, idea to try and reunify that, give it a focus so that it was a, a gathering point for all of those different efforts, particularly as it related to ocean science. Uh, the technology uh, has really changed in the last 15 years. So I think that right now we can do you know, some tremendously meaningful ocean science work in terms of uh, really getting after this and understanding it. If you think about our understanding of the ocean in the last 15 years, it's really uh, been remarkable what that's done. You know, one, one of the things I'm going to uh, do in the near future is I'm going out to Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and I'm going to speak at this event that is honoring the legacy of Walter Monk, who is just, you know, one of these epic oceanographers. And he, you know, uh, Walter Monk's impact uh, spans really, you know, uh, his entire lifetime. But, you know, here's someone who did, uh, you know, wave analysis to support landings in Normandy and, and in World War II, all the way up to us understanding, you know, what will happen if we, uh, detonate an atomic weapon over the ocean. What are the, the, the ocean response to that? Uh, he was, uh, I think, a prophet in terms of uh, ringing the bell on climate change with some of his, his experiments. And, and so, uh, you know, it, in the spirit of uh, Walter Monk, this is what Task Force Ocean strove to do. And, uh, you know, as I think about what's going to continue to occupy, you know, my passions in retirement, this is one of those things. We've got to, to, to get more coherent in our approach to that, make that data more available. We've probably got time for one more question. Anybody else? Right there in the middle. Hi, my name is Kayla Nitzberg. I actually work for the US Navy. <laughs> um, how do you bring ocean issues to the forefront of people's mind when there are bigger, more pressing issues, such as sanctions or something like that? Um, and make it more relevant so that people care and want to look into the issue. Yeah. 
Well, I think uh, we, we can't assume that uh, everybody has you know, as vivid an understanding of how important the oceans are. Uh, in fact, I think most people just, uh, it, it doesn't enter their mind at all. And so, again, I, I don't have to be too convincing in this group, but you know, it's almost no matter where you are, right? Whether you're speaking before uh, the PTA, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, watching your kid's soccer game, whatever it might be. Uh, I think that we've got to use all of those venues to uh, heighten awareness of the ocean. And we've got to do it, do it in ways that uh, really uh, are tangible to people's understanding. How do we express that, right? If we get too theoretical, if we talk about two degrees of, of temperature change over you know, a number of, I mean, that's not gonna, it's not gonna captivate it. If we talk about maybe two thirds of our economy you know, is coupled with the ocean. Two out of every three jobs is somehow related to the ocean. 99% uh, of the good, you know, we start to get to something that I think is a little bit more tangible. And then, you know, what is the threat to that, right? 99% of the world's uh, information on the internet runs on cables. If that's disrupted, we can only reconstitute about 3%, you know? And so then you start to deal with, uh, you start to discuss this in terms that People, you know, a narrative starts to form, I suppose. You know, we're predisposed to understand narrative storylines. And what is the narrative storyline that we need to create in terms of uh, the importance of the ocean to us as a nation and really us as a, as a people? And then, you know, what, where, where does climate change come into that? It, we've been all over the map, right, uh, in terms of, you know, is it really happening? Uh, do, are people really causing it? You know, all of those things. But maybe we can converge. Hey, we certainly can do better, right? I mean, who wouldn't want it? We've got the technology, we've got the intelligence to just build systems that are better. They're more sustainable. They impact the environment less. We can do that at a commercially profitable way. You know, there's all sorts of opportunities here if we just can kind of unite on a, on a narrative way forward. And, and so don't miss an opportunity to, uh, to talk about that. You know, when we leave, you know, go forth and, preach to all nations, you know, about this, uh, the importance of what we talked about here. Sometimes it gets a little bit too insular, and, uh, and we, we need kind of a broader appreciation. It needs to puncture through all of those urgent headlines that we are getting on our uh, Twitter feeds and everything else, right? So That is a wonderful note to close on. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. I really appreciate right. it. That's welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and joining us here today. Please stay in touch, stay in contact, and uh, have a great day. Thanks. I hope that